Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Flynn. I am the City Council President. Viewers can watch the City Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash citycouncil-tv. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence your cell phones, electronic devices. Thank you. I'd also like to ask everyone to be respectful of each other and do not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, you will be asked to leave. And if you feel to comply, you'll be escorted out. Please also note that according to city council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Councilor Hoyer. Councilor Baker. Here. Councilor Bach. Here. Councilor Brady. Here. Councilor Coletta. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flynn. Here. Councilor Lara. Councilor Louis Jen. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Murphy. Here. And Councilor Worrell. A quorum is present. I've been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. Mr. Clark, can you ensure the record is reflected that Councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson is present, Councilor Arroyo is present? Today's clergy is going to be introduced by City Councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson, would you please come to the podium, please? Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure for me to introduce Imam Talib of Masjid al-Quran. Born and raised in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Imam Talib is a respected community leader and spiritual guide. He is a loving husband and father of six children. His journey to Islam began December 8, 1978, right here in Boston's Masjid al-Quran. Since then, he has been a devoted member of the community serving as their imam since June 1992. Imam Talib is not only committed to Muslim community, but also to the greater community of humanity. As a whole, he believes in supporting and uplifting people in need, and he, his dedication to this work has earned him an admiration and respect across various communities. Today, we are honored to have him here with us to kick off this city council meeting. We look forward to hearing his words of wisdom and guidance and kindness as we continue to work towards a betterment of our city and its people. Please help me welcome Imam Taleb. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all. We always greet the audience with the greetings that we give in the religion of Islam. We say, assalamu alaikum, which means peace be upon you. I'm going to recite of the opening chapter of our holy book, the Holy Quran, and it's called The Opening. It's a very short chapter, seven verses. Uh, I'll, I'll say it in Arabic and then translate to English. And then I think they told me I got about 30 minutes to say something else, which I'll take about 29. I'm glad some of you all laughed because that was humor. <laughs> so, as we normally say, I guess we'll let us pray. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. 
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير مكتوب عليهم ولا طالين آمين That means with God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. The praise belongs to God, the Lord and cherished and stain of all the worlds. The merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, master of the day of judgment. Thee alone do we worship and not aid we seek. Show us the straight way. The way of those on whom you have bestowed thy blessings, not upon those who encourage your wrath, nor of those who go astray. Amen. You can sit down now. So with that, I first, uh, I'll take my 29 minutes now. <laughs> I want to really thank Councilor uh, Anderson for this invitation of saying the prayer uh, 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 to you. The last time I was here was in, on the invitation of Charles Yancey. So you know that it has been some, some time. And from Charles Yancey's time until now, we know that has been many, 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 many changes. And so I'd like to just end with another verse in our Holy Quran and just make a few remarks and then uh, I'll have my seat and listen to you. There's a chapter in the, ver in the Holy Quran that says, we have created you, verily we have created you from a male and a female, made you into nations and tribes that you may get to know one another. The most honored of you in the sight of, we say, Allah, the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is the one who is more conscious. And we say that God knows and sees all. I just want to make a few comments on the part where it says to get to know one another. I believe and I think you understand that it's very important to try to understand each other. As the Imam of Masjid Al-Quran, our community has changed. The city has changed. Boston, Massachusetts, in fact, the whole world has changed. It's incumbent upon not only myself as a religious leader, but it's incumbent upon you as our representatives to get to know one another, not in a superficial way, to get to know one another in a way because you represent me and us. So the more you get to know each other outside of the walls of the city hall, the more you all can come together and see each other, talk to each other, know each other, we'll get the benefit of your relationship. So I encourage you, to imperatively encourage you to please council members, in fact, all of us try to get to know each other because again, the more we know each other, the more we'll be able to serve each other. And it's all about not serving in an ethnic group, it's not all about serving a particular person or persons. It's about serving humanity. So thank you very much. May God bless us all. And may he continues to guide us for in, ever, in all of our actions. Thank you. Peace be upon you. Thank you. Could you uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. We have, two, we have two presentations this morning. <clears throat> Mr. We have two presentations th this morning. The first one we'll do is, th today is International Jazz Day. Um, in celebration of this day, we will now have Jazz Boston to give us a short performance. Jazz Boston has performed in this chamber in years past in recognition of International Jazz Day, so I'm delighted to have them back in the chamber again today. I would now like to invite Ken Field, the president of the board of Jazz Boston, to please come forward. Yeah. Would you, would you introduce 
your team and ask them if they would like to um, perform as well. I will. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you, President Flynn, counselors, for giving me a few minutes to speak. And I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, recognize the presence of the Chief of Arts and Culture, Cara uh, Elliott Ortega, over here. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Ken Field. I'm the president of Jazz Boston. Since 2006, we've been advocating for the Boston area jazz community of musicians, audiences, venues, and media. We have about 4,600 members, and about 60% of them open our monthly newsletters on a regular basis. They're engaged and passionate about this important music. And I did say important. The music's not just a music we enjoy or play. Jazz was created in the African-American community of New Orleans, and we think it's valuable to shine an ongoing spotlight on that history. And jazz is a somewhat unique musical style in that it focuses on spontaneous improvisation, giving it a powerful energy. Boston has played and continues to play a central role in the history of jazz. This music has spread from the US across the globe, and Jazz Boston is proud to bring you this afternoon a short performance by the Nigerian-born saxophonist, pianist, talking drummer, composer, and educator. Really, you're all those things? I guess so. Uh, Temidayo Balagan, now a Boston resident, with, with bassist, wait, with bassist Sam Smith. Uh, <laughs> they'll play a composition of Temidayo's called uh, Ijiroro, which translates to discussion which is, appropriate, which is an appropriate concept for this deliberative body, right? Uh, please enjoy. If you'd like to be informed about Jazz Boston's activities, please sign up for our email newsletter at jazzboston.org.
Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Clerk, can the re um, record be reflected that Councilor Coletta is present? At this time, I'd like to invite a, f a friend who's been the legal counsel, but also been the uh, attorney at the city law department for many years. Henry Lutine um, is one of the city's attorneys at the law department that has been with us probably, probably the longest, and someone who has served the city with distinction for, for many decades. Henry and his, his wife, his wife Marianne, is, is here with us as well. Henry is known for his knowledge, professionalism, his kindness, his integrity, and he serves as an inspiration to many of us in city government. He's retiring now after his exceptional work on behalf of the residents of Boston. I know that he will be missed. Many of his colleagues from the law department and from other city departments are with us as well. Um, at this time, I would like to recognize Henry Lutain, an outstanding an attorney and an outstanding neighbor to so many, to please come to the podium and um, on behalf of the residents of Boston, we want to say congratulations. Thank you for an incredible career and you did a tremendous job working for the residents of Boston. <laughs> Mr. President and Councillors, I want to thank you very, very much for uh, this, uh, this recognition. Um, I started as an aide to Boston City Councillor Raymond Flynn in 1982, so in many ways this is uh, uh, completing the circle. Um, and uh, I survived that and went on to serve in the Flynn administration and subsequent administrations. Uh, and, you know, at least serving uh, uh, on the staff of the City Council uh, certainly made me cognizant of the fact that this honorable body was elected by the people of Boston, and you have a heavy responsibility, which I know that you're well aware of. Um, so I, I don't want to uh, keep you from the people's business, and I do want to say thank you, thank you very much. Mr. President. Could I ask my colleagues to please join us for a photo with, with Henry and his wife? Thank you, Henry, and thank you, Marianne, for the incredible work that you provided the residents of Boston. I also want to acknowledge all the dedicated and professional City of Boston employees that are here as well. Thank you for your professionalism, hard work. And we do have another special guest, a group, a group of um, young students from Brighton High is also in the chamber. We want to welcome these high school students. Welcome. <laughs> I 
We're on to the first order of business, which is the approval of the minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting as presented. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting, say aye. aye. All opposed, say nay. Thank you. The minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communications from her honor, the mayor, Mr. Clark, please read docket 0812. Docket number 0812, message in order for your approval of the ordinance that all members of the Building Remissions Reduction and Disclosure Review Board, also known as BIRDO, as defined in the section of the City of Boston Code Ordinance, Chapter 7, Section 7-2.2, shall be deemed as special municipal employees for the purposes of Chapter 268A of the General Laws. Filed in the Office of the City Clerk on April 24, 2023. Thank you. This docket 0812 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0813. Message in order, uh, docket number 0813. Message in order for your approval. In order that will authorize the Department of Innovation and Technology to enter into a contract with a term of up to seven years for data center hosting with co-location and fiber interconnection to provide uninterrupted functionality. Such a contract would support citywide services and operations. Thank you. This docket 0813 will be referred to the Committee on City Services, Innovation, Technology. Mr. Kirk, please read docket 0814 and 0815, please. Docket number 0814, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $430,419 in the form of a grant for the Federal Fiscal Year 23 Senior Companion Program, awarded by the Corporation for National and Community Service to be administered by the H. Strong Commission. The grant will fund reimbursement for travel and meals, plus stipends for volunteers who provide companionship to homebound and frail seniors. And docket number 0815, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $137,753 in the form of a grant for the Fiscal Year 23 Retired Senior Volunteer Program, awarded by the Corporation for National and Community Service, to be administered by the H. Strong Commission. The grant will fund reimbursement for meals and travel for senior community service volunteers. Thank you. These dock at 0814, 0815 will be referred to the Committee on Strong Women, Families, and Communities. Mr. Clerk, please read dock at 0816. Docket number 0816, message in order, authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $45,000 in the form of a grant from the Galilean Fund for the Boston, at the Boston Foundation, awarded by the Charities Aid Foundation America to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. The grant will fund the Faye Chandler Emerging Artist Awards. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Acletta, the Chair of the Committee on Arts, Culture, and Special Events. Uh, Council Acletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. As Chair of the Arts and Culture Committee, I'm asking consideration of my colleagues to suspend and pass uh, Docket 0816. This is a grant that would fund the Faye Chandler Artist Awards through the Galilean Fund at the Boston Foundation, awarded by the Charities Aid Foundation of America and administered by the Office of Arts and Culture. I've been asked by the Mayor's Office to push this forward expeditiously, and I'm get, again, I'm asking for consideration to suspend and pass. Thank you. Thank you, Council Coletta. Council Coletta seeks suspension of the rules. Passage of Docket 0816. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, po aye. all opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0817. To 0825, please. Docket number 0817, message in order for a confirmation of the appointment of Kendra Lara as a member of the Building Emissions Reduction and Disclosure Review Board, also known as BIRDO, for the term expiring April 24, 2026. Docket number 0818, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Gail Lattimore as a member of the Building Emissions Reduction and Disclosure Review Board, also known as BIRDO, for the term expiring April 24, 2026. Docket number 0819, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of uh, Kai Palmer Dun Dunning for, as a member of the Building Emissions Reduction and Disclosure Review Board for a term expiring April 24, 2026. Docket number 0820. Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Lee 
Matsueda as a member of the Building Emissions Reduction and Disclosure Review Board for a term expiring April 24, 2026. Docket number 0821, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Rashida Boyd as a member of the Building Emissions Reduction and Disclosure Review Board for a term expiring April 24, 2026. Docket number 0822, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Matt O'Malley as a member of the Building Emissions Reduction and Disclosure Review Board for a term expiring April 24, 2026. Docket number 0823, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Jack Nelson as a member of the Building Emissions Reduction and Disclosure Review Board for a term expiring April 24, 2026. Docket number 0824, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Lovett Jacobs as a member of the Building Emissions Reduction and Disclosure Review Board for a term expiring April 24, 2026. And docket number 0825, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Stephen Ellis as a member of the Building Emissions Reduction and Disclosure Review Board as, for a term expiring April 24, 2026. Thank you. These dockets 0817 through 0825 will be referred to the Committee on Environmental Justice, Resil Resiliency, Parks. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0826. Docket number 0826. Message transmitting certain information under Section 17F relative to the City of Boston's redistricting court case legal counsel and witness hired to testify. Docket number 0758. Passed by the Council on April 5th, 2023. Thank you, 0826. Docket 0826 will be placed on file. Reports of public officers and others. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0827 to 0829. Docket number 0827, Council of Braden offer the following. Communication was received from Council of Liz Braden disclosing for release to the public certain electronic correspondence dated April 5th, 2023. Docket number 0828, notice was received from the City Clerk in accordance with Chapter 6 of the Ordinances of 1979 relative to action taken by the Mayor on papers acted upon by the City Council at its meeting on March 22nd, 2023. Docket number 0829, notice was received from the Mayor of her absence from the City from Tuesday, April 18, 2023 at 12 p.m., returning Saturday, April 22nd, 2023 at 12 p.m. Thank you. These dockets 0827 to 0829 will be placed on file. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0830. Docket number 0830, Council of Flynn offer the following. Order from Council President Flynn to the Law Department on addressing open meeting law complaints. We received these complaints last week and the complaints alleged four instances of potential open meeting law violations. This order would allow the Law Department to review the complaints and prepare responses. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes. Did someone say nay? I'm no. Okay. Was okay. The, the ayes have it. The, the order is passed. Reports of committee. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0789 through 0809 together? Docket number 0789, the Committee of the Whole, to which was referred on April 12, 2023. Docket number 0789, order for a special preliminary municipal election for District 8 City Councilor on June 27, 2023, and special municipal election on July 25, 2023. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. And docket number 0809. The Committee on Rules and Administration, to which was referred on April 12, 2023, docket number 0809, Ordinance Amending the City of Boston Code, Ordinances Section 2-9.2, in regard to Council District 8, submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass in a new draft. Chair recognizes Councillor Flynn, Chair of the Committee on Rules and Administration and Chair of the Committee of a Whole. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Council Braden. Um, I would like to substitute the language for the committee report and amend ordinance in docket 0809, the substitution for the committee report and the substitution for the amended ordinance include one added sentence clarifying that the election department can make adjustments to the addresses if needed due to ongoing voter registration. I believe these should be on everyone's desk. Okay. Um, seeing and hearing no objections, the committee report and amended ordinance on docket 0809 are substituted. Does, an, does everyone have the substitute committee report and amended ordinance on their desk? Mr. Flynn, or, sorry, Mr. Flynn, Pre <laughs> President Flynn, please continue. <laughs> Thank you, Council Braden. Um, docket 0789 is the order for a special preliminary municipal election for District 8 City Council on June 27, 2023, and a special municipal election on July 25, 2023. This was filed at the last meeting, and there is no issue from the Election Department. We would need to vote on this order today so that the Election Department can prepare for these elections. Docket, then I'll go into docket 089. Do you want to deal with 0789 uh, okay. first? Yeah. Um, so the uh, Councillor Flynn and the chair, chair on the Committee of the Whole seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of Zocket 0789. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those say and opposed? The ayes have it. This docket is passed. Councillor Flynn, would you like to continue with docket 0809? Yes, thank, thank you, um, Councilor Braden. So as, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole and Rules, I would, I'd like to recommend passage also of, of the next docket. Um, I'm going to ask Council Bach at this time if she would like to speak on this um, and give you an opportunity to um, provide the further details. The Chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Oops. Uh, um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you to President Flynn. Um, this, uh, this docket, um, as filed as we discussed uh, last meeting, is designed to allow the <coughs> mapping of the new precincts, which are now what um, voters' information is affiliated with in elections and systems, to the old district for the re-election, um, for the special election. Um, since filing, uh, elections and the Secretary of State's office have worked together on that information, and so the docket now reflects um, all of the addresses that fall within each sub precinct with that mapping. Um, and as Councillor Flynn alluded to at the request of the Elections Commissioner Tavares, um, it also includes a line just saying that if somebody were to show up tomorrow and register in an address that falls in the sub precinct that isn't currently on the list, they would be able to add that. Um, so it's uh, it's really a um, a data administration management uh, clarification for our elections departments that it's clear that they have the authority to use um, the voter rolls as uh, as they have them in their system. So thank you, Madam. Oh. Thank you, Madam. Thank Chair. you, Councillor Bach. President Flynn, have you any further comments? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just as the as the chair, I'd like to recommend passage of this docket at zero eight zero nine. Thank you. Um, Councillor Flynn, the Chair of the Committee on Rules and Administration, seeks acceptance of the Committee Report and Passage of Zocket 0809 in a new draft. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Any, all those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket is passed. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. We're on to matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, docket 0760207 please.
Which one is it? Oh yeah, um, zero six zero seven. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I I like to go back. We're on docket zero six zero seven two zero six one zero. Are withdrawn. Mr. Clerk, could you read docket? They they're withdrawn. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket zero five two one, please? Docket number 0521, the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology, to which was referred on March 8, 2023. Docket number 0521, order for a study on city wages and services for the lowest paid municipal employees. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass in a new draft. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Bach, the chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President, um, and thank you to Councilor Lou Jen for filing this order along with Councilor Anderson and myself. Um, it's, uh, it's, it was actually not an order for a hearing. It was an order to commission the um, administration to produce this report on our lowest paid city workers with an eye to the question of how we could um, set a higher kind of minimum standard and really tackle the question that Councillor Louis Jen and so many councillors have raised around um, making sure that especially you know in a city where we do require residency of so many of our workers that people are making enough to actually live in the city of Boston. Um, so uh, what I'm recommending as the chair is that the order pass in order to commission the report. Um, it's been amended just to reflect a deadline of July 1st um, for the report but uh, also an understanding with the administration of an intention to try to provide intermediate um, data updates um, along the way prior to July 1st. Uh, so that's the, um, that's the new draft. And before moving to a vote, Mr. Chair, if Councilor Louis Jen wanted to say anything. The Chair recognizes Councilor Louis Jen. Councilor Louis Jen, you have the floor. Thank you. I want to say thank you to the Chair for her help with this order, making sure that this was um, taken care of before she sadly departs this body. Um, a study like this is long overdue. Uh, and I'm encouraged that the administration also agrees um, and agrees on the attention to our lowest paid workers. Um, together, we're taking the next steps to ensure that our employees are being fairly compensated for their hard work. Um, as a city, we rely on the dedication and co uh, commitment of our municipal employees at all levels to provide essential services to our residents and to us here. Um, from our municipal protective service officers to our janitorial staff and beyond, these employees work tirelessly to help keep our city running smoothly. And Councilor Fernand Janderson was a, a co-sponsor with me on this. I know that uh, she herself and Councilor Flynn um, also had a, a hearing order or a resolution for our municipal officers. So just want to um, thank all the workers for elevating this issue to us. I especially want to thank Joe Scott, who is a really committed city employee former janitor who has now moved on to a different office, but who came and spent time with me uh, courageously, um, even though other workers wanted to be there, but were fearful. He came into my office and, and, and really um, urged me uh, to do this work. And so I want to just give him a shout out who comes from a great, um, a great family here in our city. Um, it's important that we have a comprehensive study to examine the wages and benefits of our lowest paid municipal employees. This study will include a review of all salaries, so we're not just restricting it, restricting it to municipal employees, but it's going to be the, fo the focus will be on our lowest wage workers and the possibility of establishing a municipal minimum wage and to report findings to the City Council for a public hearing. This is important, especially as we have employers in this city and we ask them to do right by our residents. We are often on picket lines and standing in solidarity with workers demanding that they get extra pay, but um, we need to uh, be also self-reflective and make sure that we are providing a good example to employers in the city. The findings of the study will be used to better inform uh, budget decisions and, and future budget allocations, and I suspect the study will affirm the need for increased wages and codifying a municipal, um, municipal minimum wage to ensure we are supporting our lowest paid municipal employees. Um, like, uh, lastly, I want to thank everyone for their hard work. I know that everyone on this body really cares about this issue. Um, and I want to thank the uh, municipal employees for your contributions to, to this city. Um, as uh, Councilor Box stated, we require people to live in what is the second most expensive city to rent, a city in which it, you're required uh, uh, to have uh, at least an income of $180,000 to purchase a home. 
Um, and I think that we have to do better by our municipal employees in, in, in recognizing that reality. Um, so I look forward to getting this report from the administration and um, urge them to work very uh, as quickly as possible so that we can have some data at least beginning in June to help influence budget. Um, and I also just want to thank Chief Lawrence because I know this is something that she deeply cares about. Um, and I think this focus on Lois um, paid workers is going to give them the urgency that we all want and need. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor oh, Lujan. I'm Rick. Did you already say? Yeah. Okay. Um, before before we take a vote, I just wanted to add one one brief comment. We're talking about the lowest paid city employees during this conversation and they're the most diverse union in the city of Boston is the municipal police officers. They come up here and they protect us. They protect the public. Most of them are people of color and, and women. They're not getting a fair, wa fair wage. I, I don't know how we, we as a body, I know we, we've, we, we supported them, but as a body, we, we need to make sure that those workers are treated with respect. In my opinion, they're not being treated with respect. And the most diverse, work for, diverse union in the city of Boston <coughs> are not even receiving a fair wage. Um, thank you, Council Bach, and thank you, Council Louis Jean. Um, <coughs> Council Bach, the chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology, seeks acceptance of the committee report, report and passage of docket 0521 in a new draft. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it, the docket is passed. For the possible action. Oh, okay. Yeah. The next, the next um, topic is Matt has recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, will you please read together the docket 0760 to 0782, and these are the, these are relating to ways and means issues. Docket numbers 0760 through 0762, orders for the fiscal year 24 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits, also known as OPEB. Docket numbers 0763, 0765, and 0766, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Docket numbers 0764, 0767, and 0768, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Docket numbers 0769 through 0780, orders auth authorizing limits for departmental revolving funds for fiscal year 24, including law, tourism, arts and culture, environment, Boston Centers for Youth and Families, schools and parks. Docket number 0781, message in order authorizing the appropriation of $1,200,000 from the income of the George Francis Parkman Fund. The funds are to be expended under the direction of the Commissioner of Parks and Recreation for the maintenance and improvement of Boston Common and Parks in existence since January 12, 1887. And docket number 0782, message in order approving an appropriation of $4,500,000 from the 21st Century Fund, also known as the Public Education or Governmental Access, also known as PEG, and cable related fund, pursuant to section 53F and three quarters of chapter 44 of the general laws. The funds may be used to support PEG access services, to monitor compliance with the cable franchise agreement, and for preparation of renewal of the franchise license. Thank you, Mr. Clark. The Chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson, the Chair of the Committee on Ways and Means. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Committee on Ways and Means um, uh, held the first hearing for the budget season. Uh, we jumped right in the overview of the operating budget. Um, myself and Councilor uh, President Flynn, joined by Councilor President Flynn, Councilor Mejia, 
Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Baker, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Lujan, Councilor Worrell, Councilor Lara, and Councilor Coletta were present. Um, we were joined by uh, Jim and um, Chief uh, Grafenberger from the, mayor, from the uh, OBM's office and conducted a or at least attempted a uh, transparent conversation. Uh, main topics of uh, sources of budget allocations such as property taxes and revenue and, uh, and allocations for this uh, fiscal, year or fiscal year 24. For uh, then the, in the afternoon, we held a uh, capital, uh, a hearing on capital budget and I was joined by the administration, Ashley Garfenberger, Jim Williamson, direct, uh, Chief um, of Equity, Maria Angeli Soli Savera, Chief of Streets, Yasha Franklin Hodge, Chief of Energy, Environment, and Open Space, Reverend Mariama White Hammond, Chief of Operations, Dion Irish, Parks Commissioner, Ryan Woods, Chief of Capital Planning uh, for BPS, Del Stanilis, Sam DePina, Deputy Superintendent of Operations for BPS. And um, also there were, we were joined by other administration um, folks that were in the audience to um, observe or support with the conversation. The administration presented Mayor Wu's um, FY24 to 28 uh, five-year capital plan totaling $4.2 billion, uh, presenting a $600 million increase. The city's five-year capital plan is split into two types of projects and programs. The administration reviewed the city's inventory of capital assets and associated funding sources, as well as five-step process to building the budget, which includes identifying and prioritizing mayor and community values, meeting with department experts evaluating the impact of new projects on the financial need of existing projects and commitments, introducing the plan to the council and the community, and then engaging the council and community about their priorities and goals. The administration reviewed um, where the capital plan funds will be spent, with the top three spending areas being streets and infrastructure, schools and environment and open space, and then on to public safety. The administration planned a capital plan will undertake major projects across the city that support green and growing city, ensure public health and safety, but Boston families uh, first, and deliver exceptional city services. Um, for public testimony, there were many people um, in the audience who, after the breakdown of the budget or data visualization presented or requested by myself to a new budget analyst, um, the community felt that the capital plans were highly um, inequitable or racially inequitable, that there were still a lot of work to be done, and that they also expressed that they wanted more of these hearings in person and in community. So with that in mind, uh, the administration expressed that um, it was still a proposal, that it wasn't final, uh, that it could be, that, that it was open for discussion. Um, the community then expressed, you know, sentiments about historical harms and how a lot of these uh, infrastructure kind of focuses were prioritizing the more um, affluent communities still, and that there were still not enough inf investments in black and brown communities. So um, with that in mind, the schedule that I've put together so far, um, obviously um, I think some of my colleagues know that is um, subject to, to some change in terms of the uh, reception or uh, feedback from the community. I will definitely um, notify departments at least uh, seven days, seven business days in advance of any changes that I make. Also, the Committee on uh, Ways and Means, <laughs> I held a hearing yesterday um, in, the, in the morning and um, afternoon, uh, and we first um, held a hearing with Office of uh, Arts and Culture um, and discussed new programs such as pipeline programs to cultivate space for young artists and allocation of budget to theater, uh, the Strand Theater and cultural art spaces and placemaking 
additionally proactive about um, displacement in communities was discussed and its implication through the art community. Um, just wanted to commend uh, Chief Kara for her great leadership in just stepping in and uh, ensuring placement for artists that were getting displaced. Um, for this uh, department discussion, uh, I was joined by my council colleague, Council Flaherty, Council Bra Braden, Council Mejia, Council Flynn, Council Murphy, Council Lujan, Council Worrell. Thank you so much for your feedback. Then also uh, the committee held a hearing on with the Office of Tourism, Sports and Entertainment. We were joined by uh, John Borders the fourth, um, our new director of tourism and sports and entertainment. Uh, new plans of sports arena across Boston were discussed, creating more equal standing ground for people of color in the sports world as well. Also in how to connect offices tourism with already occurring arts and initiatives in Nubian Square. Um, in this hearing, uh, I was joined by my council colleague, uh, or in this discussion with the department, by my council colleague Mejia, Council Mejia, Council Lujan, Council Lara, and myself. Also, um, we in the afternoon, we held a hearing with the law department, um, joined by council colleague, Council Murphy, Council Braden, Council Flaherty, Council Coletta, Council Mejia, and Council Worrell. Um, and in also the Treasury Department, joined by Council Braden, Council Mejia, Council Worrell, Council Lujan, and Council Flynn. And then auditing, I was joined by Council Mejia and Council Lujan. Uh, the hearing, um, that we uh, that was held uh, overall discussed the uh, exciting functions of auditing and treasury department um, and uh, all that goes on in law. My colleagues had um, very good questions on in terms of the role and uh, the process of determining who gets prioritized in terms of representation um, and just reviewed um, overall allocations in terms of need. Um, from the law department, there was feedback that they had uh, plenty of uh, funds in the budget to do exactly what they needed to do in order to represent everyone um, in the city, uh, everyone in terms of who they're supposed to represent. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Those dockets 0760 through 0782 will remain in committee. Sorry, mm -hmm. Councillor Flynn. My yeah, the chair recognizes Councillor Fernandez Anderson. I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that tomorrow, April 27th, we will have the two virtual format hearings dedicated to Boston Public Health um, at 10 a.m., as well as um, at 2 p.m. Uh, I I ask that these dockets remain in committee. I just wanted to share that uh, some of my colleagues, or at least one or two, have uh, reached out, and a reporter uh, has reached out about the schedule for the hearings. Um, I personally don't have a preference, and I, I, I actually like being in person, but in order for me to lead this in a democratic way, I have to accommodate uh, everyone. So some folks have expressed that they prefer virtual hearings and some folks say that they prefer that the community is better heard and there's actually research that shows that there's more participation from community um, virtually. Although when I've held hearings in person, the community, although less participation, they prefer it in person. So it's a juggle and it's a balancing act that I have to uh, create. And so I will be hold, holding um, 17 hearings virtually and the remaining in person. Um, and also there's all, a lot of contention about um, the process to which the mayor and the council uh, discusses district priorities. And we are looking for a more transparent conversation about uh, councilors expressed that they, or they made requests to the mayor and it was not responded to or they did not get anything that they asked for in their district. Um, and so in order for me to be totally honest with this process, I feel that it is my responsibility to, and I owe it to the people of Boston, to say this process is actually not a process. It's one that it's just by choice and it's still a conversation. We hope that the mayor 
can open up to discussing more um, priorities and feedback from the councillors, especially district councillors who are close to the community, to be able to actually advocate for their community and get something in the, op in the capital budget. Thus far, um, at least five of the councillors have expressed, or seven rather, have expressed that from the request in the hearing, you can see it live, from the request that they made through the administration, that they got nothing that they asked for. So I'm not sure how accurate that is. I'm just uh, making sure that I'm transparent about it. This um, position holds a lot of conflict and contention, a lot of politics. And with that, um, I'm not sure if the Boston Globe or the Herald, I don't even care which newspaper did it, but from what I hear, someone screenshot it and sent me messages. As a chair of Ways and Means and as a black woman trying to represent people, most vulnerable people in Roxbury in District 7, it's been quite a process, a spiritual questioning, a, a, a test, um, a sacrifice even. My own children are being attacked. Um, in fact, retaliation from, pol from politicians and from politics and from people in city government is coming, is coming close to my home. I am not going to disclose here today exactly what's happening because I'm going to be looking for an investigation. But it is not okay when you retaliate and hurt people's families. And it's not okay for people to be so emotionally reactive because when you disagree, whether it's redistricting or whether it's ways and means or whether it's you don't get stuff, then you get your cronies and your people to go in newspapers and attack people on a personal level. I saw what they said about you, Mr. President, and I'm sorry that they said that. I'm sorry to all of my colleagues for all of the hurtful things that were said. Um, but for me personally, not only do I get death threats, I get caught out, I've, I've said this before, I get cut out magazine threats, I get find Jesus, Muhammad is a fake prophet, I get all this stuff and I get, you know, go back to your, go back to Africa, and you heard the message, and plus now this article, they want us to die, they want us to disappear. It's not, it's not funny and, um, Again, I'm not going to speak about how they retaliated against my own sons, and soon enough I will, because this includes people in this building, this includes politicians, this includes people out, the protesters, this includes everybody. It's getting ugly, and I want no parts of it. I'm not a vindictive person, because I want to save my own soul, I want to represent my community and be safe. I owe no one but my constituents and God. I serve my constituents because I love people, because that is my responsibility as my job. I serve people because I am a Muslim and I want to be a good person. I'm not saying I am, I'm saying I'm trying to be a good person. But none of us here deserve it. Even Frank Baker doesn't deserve it. Wow. <laughs> and, that, but I got it too. and you know I like I you. Because you know I like you. Even Frank Baker doesn't deserve it. People come down hard on him. Even Frank Baker deserves it. Nobody deserves it. People Ms. are doing Mr. their Mr. job. Council Baker. Council Baker. Can, can the, the chair so, recognizes Council Fernandez? Thank answer. you. Even Frank Baker doesn't because the chair, re Council Baker, can, the chair recognizes Council Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Council Baker. Okay, Council Baker. Ma'am, ma'am, can you please be quiet? Uh, the chair recognizes the chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Thank Council you. Fernandez Anderson has the floor. Thank when you. someone has the floor, no one else should be speaking. I apologize for defending you, Council Baker. I will not mention your name again. I. No one deserves it. My point is no one deserves it. I'm not the best. English is my fourth language. I'm not the best in expressing myself. So I apologize. I am expressing this in the Ways and Means Committee report because people take this committee or the redistricting one or another one 
and they retaliate. People call the globe, people tell on each other, people are cussing out each other, and then the public says, can't you get along? The public, is, is, the public sometimes is at fault too, because they get together and they get messy, and people are attacking each other in the city. Like, it's, like we don't have lives, like we don't deserve to just do our jobs with dignity and go home. So maybe people don't want to hear it. Maybe people are afraid of having honest conversations. But the politics, it's nonsense. It's filthy. It's dirty. It's corrupt. And whatever you got to do, keep your chin up for all of you, my council colleagues that got insulted and was told that they should disappear. For all of the insults that they said to my council colleague, Council, council, uh, uh, council Arroyo, for everybody that got insulted, it's not true, and I'm here to say that it's not okay. Nobody wants to talk about it. I'm standing up and I'm saying it's ridiculous. Don't give a damn about your Robert's rules. I'm telling you right now that people are human beings and we don't deserve it. So with the politics of not getting anything in our district, and it's supposed to be a process. With the politics of discussing it and the, the department heads have to ask for priorities, but we counselors that are close to the issue, we don't get to advocate for the art priorities. On top of that, I got to fight the administration, I got to fight the departments, I got to fight the trolls, I got to fight everybody because I'm black or because I'm Muslim or because I'm a woman. I'm not afraid of y'all or anybody else. I only, I'm only afraid of my Lord. So I'm standing here and I'm saying that it's not okay. Come for me. I don't care. I owe you nothing but to serve my Lord and do right by my people and my children. Come for my family. I'm bringing all the smoke. And that's what I'm telling you. Now, everybody can play their pretty politics and take pictures and pretend everything's okay. Don't take pictures with me if you know that you're threatening my family. Don't smile at me. Don't come next to me because I have a right to defend my sons. I appreciate you, Council Flynn. I know you allowed me to rant because you know it was necessary. And I'm sorry that I took too long to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. For as we go forward during the, the, the budget, the, the, the chair of the budget committee, in my opinion, has as much time as the chair needs to discuss what took place recently on, on, on a hearing. I'm not going to limit the minutes of a, a chair, whether it's Ways and Means or another chair, to talk about an issue that they've been working on, that they need to speak on, and I think, I think it's important that the, the chairs of, of committees are able to speak on a subject that they put a lot of work into. And I'm not, I'm not going to limit the number of minutes a chair speaks on a topic during matters recently heard for possible action. Um, thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. So these dockets, there was, tw there was 22 dockets. These dockets 0760 through 0782 will, will remain in committee. We're on to motions, orders, and resolutions. At this time, I'm going to take one of them out of, out of order. Um, Mr. Clerk, can we first go to docket 0836, please? Docket number 0836. Councillor Mejia and Councillor Coletta offer the following. Resolution calling for non-discrimination and quality health care for immigrants and communities of color. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councillor Mejia. Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I just want to uh, send um, my love to my colleague, Councilor Anderson, and it's hard to just get up and do business as usual when we're, all, when we're all carrying so much. So I just want to say thank you, Councilor Anderson, for having the courage to speak in this chamber the way that you do and know that it is, uh, you're not just speaking for yourself, you're speaking for a lot of us. So I appreciate that. All right. 
So, Mr. President, um, first, thank you for taking this out of order. I really do appreciate your patience with us, and um, I would like to uh, suspend the rules and add Councilor Louis Jean as a co-sponsor. Hearing no objection, Councilor Louis Jean is added as a third co-sponsor. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Uh, thank you. And I would also like to suspend the rules and ask my colleagues to vote in the affirmative of this resolution, calling for a non-discriminatory and quality health care for immigrants of color. So I'm just going to lay it out for you. Um, so I, I often talk about the fact that I was uh, raised by a single mom who was undocumented. And because my mother was undocumented, um, access to care often came at the expense of whether or not we were going to have the courage. Um, to seek it. But when you are undocumented or when you're an immigrant, um, you do have access and the right to quality <coughs> care. And so the Boston City Council has an obligation to ensure that all Bostonians have equal access to quality and affordable health care services. Racial and ethnic disparities in health care are widespread and pervasive, resulting in significantly higher rates of heart failure, stroke, hospitalization, diabetes-related death in communities of color than our white counterparts. The city of Boston is celebrated for its high-quality health care system, but the city of Boston is not immune to the persistent racial and ethnic um, inequalities. The East Boston Neighborhood Center Clinic is the largest community health center in Massachusetts and one of the largest in the nation. It provides health care services to many families and children in Boston's immigrant communities. However, concerns have been shared with several elected officials regarding East Boston Neighborhood Health Clinic's quality of care. In March of 2022, Centro Presente, an East Boston-based organization, discovered that several patients did not receive adequate care and all shared the same profile. They are all women, immigrants, particularly Spanish speaking, low income, and all have mass health insurance. The treatment of Central Presenters members is just one example of how much a larger trend of healthcare inequities we see here and across the country. High quality health care should be provided equally to all residents, regardless of their race, national origin, social economic status, immigration status, age, gender, or sexual orientation. I ask that my colleagues join me in reaffirming that all community health care centers should be committed to thoroughly examining and reforming treatment policies to guard against misdiagnosis and substandard care and to improve the translation and interpretation services to ensure language is not a barrier to quality health care and insurance um, and all health care and administrative staff is received is culturally competent and trauma-informed care training to be uh, better served of Boston diverse communities. At the end of the day, the women in East Boston are not just asking for an apology. They're asking for accountability and to be affirmed. And I think as a council, we have an opportunity not to just support them in this process, but to stand up. And I also would like to thank my colleague and my second co-sponsor, Councilor Coletta, for her leadership and always standing up um, and showing up for East Boston. So um, I just wanted to read this into the record and thank Centro Presente and all the women that are here um, who shared their stories with us um, and sometimes that's the hardest part, is to show up and to speak truth to power. But our responsibility is, is when we hear the truth, then the power must be ceded back to the people, and we must respond in ways that they ask us to. And I'm standing here to say I'm here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The Chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and I just want to thank my co-sponsors, Councilor Mejia and Louis Jean, um, for their partnership. I'd also like to thank Central Presente and the Lawyers Committee for, for Civil Rights uh, for, for your work um, in supporting these individuals and these families who came forward to tell their story. Um, we've heard directly from these courageous individuals, predominantly immigrant women of color, uh, who assert that their needs were not adequately met at the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. 
everyone deserves equitable treatment and access to the highest, that very, very highest standard of health care, especially our immigrant brothers and sisters and all those disproportionately impacted by health inequities. I stand in solidarity with former patients who are calling for accountability and better practices by the health center. And the health center does uh, good work, right? They, we, we, we respect one another. They did good work during the COVID-19 pandemic. They just, as we all do, need to understand where we made mistakes and open up to it and be held accountable. They're calling for, and they, as, as in the families, are calling for better quality care of, of East Boston Spanish-speaking population because that is simply what they deserve. In general, we must do everything we can to remedy the systemic inequities in healthcare that ultimately result in instances of malpractice, hospitalization, and even death in communities of color in comparison to white populations. Many come to Boston as a bastion of world-class healthcare. Many people make the journey to this country in search of everything that we have to offer, economic opportunities, housing, and yes, our healthcare. It's honestly devastating to think that some of these individuals were met with barriers um, uh, to their health, and now it threatens uh, their life. I stand with them and call for a reformation of uh, treatment policies to provide uh, better translation services and that staff receive cultural competency um, training so that they can better service our neighbors. And thank you so much for telling your story and being so brave. Appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you, Council Aquetta. The chair, the chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I, I want to thank the sponsors, and I want to thank Senator Presente, and I want to thank uh, the not only for your advocacy, but how personal your stories are that you shared with me. And healthcare is so personal and it's private, and you shouldn't have to share with all of us um, the intimacy of your health needs. But sometimes that's what's required to get justice that you demand. And so um, I think my colleagues have made a lot of the points, but I just want to thank um, Central Presente. Um, you deserve an apology for what you've experienced. You deserve uh, to know that there are translators. You deserve an, a center that's focused on the needs and the, and the health needs of immigrants, especially undocumented folks. None of this is asking for too much. It's actually sometimes asking for too little. Um, and I know I've said this on the chamber's floor before, you know, I don't walk around ever saying I'm a lawyer unless I'm in a hospital. Because we know that hospitals too often discriminate against our black and brown folks, discriminate against uh, folks who are undocumented. So I join my colleagues in asking uh, the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center to meet this moment. And, and like Councilor Coletta said, they meet the moment um, in other situations. We want them to meet the moment here to really listen, to really center um, what's been happening and to make sure that we, are, we know what's happening when there's a misdiagnosis, and we're doing everything we can to prevent that from happening because our communities deserve healing, not only on the back end, but on the front end, right? Prevention. Um, and so I want to thank all of you for being here and for your advocacy. This work is a result of all of you, and, and, and we will continue to stand with you. Thank you. Thank you, Council louis -Jean. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Worrell, Councillor Royal, please add the chair. Councillor Mejia Coletta, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Louis Jean, seek suspension of the rules and adoption of 0836. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it, the docket has been adopted. Mr. Mr. Clark, before we go on, can you let the record be reflected that Council Worrell is present? He was here a while ago. I, I failed to um, recognize him. Mr. Clark, can we? Can you please read docket 0837, please? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. So now, now we're going back in in, in order. Docket number 0831, Councilor Bach and Flynn offer the following, a petition for a special law relative to an act to make certain updated changes in the law re relative to historic Beacon Hill District. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, this is actually uh, the same home rule petition that we uh, passed previously, but um, that version hasn't been signed by the mayor because it came up afterwards that the version of the exclusion language um, that we had related to the sidewalks to 
make sure that um, that there would, wouldn't be an issue there uh, was flagged by the Disability Commission as them needing a slight adjustment to it. So there's just a one phrase uh, adjustment in this version, um, and uh, and so we're uh, hoping to hoping with the chair's indulgence to suspend and pass through today so that the updated version can hit the mayor's desk. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President and Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Council Block. I'm not going to speak on this matter. Um, but would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say that as chair, I support a suspension and passage of this document. It's a simple edit uh, made by the uh, Disabilities Commission, which I think is important to make sure it's reflected in this. So I do support a suspension and pass today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Th thank you, Council Arroyo. Would anyone like to sign, uh, would anyone like to um, raise your hand to support this? Um, Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Royal, Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Louis-Jean, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Worrell. Um, so the chair is going to recognize Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, the, um, the chair of Royal is agreeing not to hold a hearing and will go straight to a vote. Yes. That's okay with you. Okay. Um, so Councilor Bach, and Councilor Flynn seek suspension of the rules in passage of docket 0831. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. This, Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote, please? Roll call vote on docket 0831. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta, <laughs> Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara, Councilor Louis Jen, yes. Councilor Louis Jen, yes. Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell, yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Doc number 0831 has received eight votes in the affirmative. Thank, thank you, Mr. Clerk. This is passed. We're on to do, um, docket 0832, please. Docket number 0832, Councilor Flynn offered the following. Order for a hearing to discuss the creation of an Office of Pest Control in the City of Boston. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Braden. <coughs> Councillor Council Braden, may I add Councillor Coletta as an original co-sponsor? Hearing no objection, Councillor Coletta is added as original co-sponsor. Thank you, and thank you for, thank Councillor Coletta and all of my colleagues really for the tremendous work you have done on pest control, working closely with the mayor's office and various departments. So I want to acknowledge John Elric as well and so many dedicated and professional City of Boston employees that have done tireless work on pest control. As you know, pest control, like, like you, it's one of my top priorities. Um, it's an important quality of life issue. It has an impact on almost every neighborhood in the city. Over the last several weeks and over the last several years, we've discussed this issue at great length. But recently, I have talked about a potential dedicated office for pest control in the city of Boston or a dedicated position for pest control in our office. Currently, pest control is a cross-departmental effort with inspectional services, public works, Boston Water and Soil Commission does um, pest control, and others in other departments as well. Recently, New York City has appointed its first director of rodent mitigation, also known as the RATSA, a position tasked with coordinating across government agencies, the private sector, and community organizations to strategize on pest control and reduce the rat population. Having a dedicated position in office on pest control 
would allow us to better address the issue, allow for a more streamlined and coordinated process in reducing pests, and come up with a more innovative way and prevent pest infect infestations. So I'm filing this hearing in hope that we can discuss the possibility of creating an Office of Pest Control in the City of Boston and proactively address this issue. And again, I, I want to acknowledge the, the hard work of the City of Boston employees that are currently doing this job. They work hard. They're dedicated to their job. They're dedicated to the residents of the city. And I have great respect for the work they do. My, my challenge is after the, during the pandemic, we have seen the significant increase in rat, rats throughout, throughout every neighborhood of Boston. We have seen ongoing construction that also impacts more rats in, in various neighborhoods. We have outdoor dining that we traditionally haven't had before the pandemic. And outdoor dining is here to stay in, in, in many neighborhoods. So for many reasons, I, I want to work with my colleagues, work with the Wu administration, work with the city departments to think about how we can coordinate resources, coordinate services, and eventually, in my opinion, come up with a city department that would recognize how significant this public health, public safety, quality of life issue is to so many residents. And want to thank my colleagues for the work on this issue recently, and thank my colleagues working on this issue in the past. But I also want to thank the residents of Boston, because they really are the ones that have called their district councilors almost nonstop, and, and, and their at-large councilors, but they've called us nonstop, they've texted us, they've, they've emailed us, they've, they've seen us at the grocery stores, and they tell us about certain streets in their neighborhood where rats are, are running wild. So when we do have this conversation about pest control and potentially adding this as a city department, we want to make sure the residents of Boston are heard during this process because they have excellent feedback and excellent input that they want to be part of the process, working with city departments and people outside of government as well. I do hope to visit New York City in the next 30 days to speak to um, some of their city officials on establishing this new city department, how it's working, what impact it's having, and if any, any of my colleagues would like to join me for about a 20-hour visit to New York, we, I'll, I will let you know the details. But um, again, I want to say thank you to my colleagues in government for the important work you are doing, working close with Mayor Wu, city departments on pest control issues. Th thank you. Thank you, Council Brady. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, the chair recognizes Councillor Coletta. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Braden. I have to say, uh, again, reiterating this, the rats are going to hate this. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is what was said in New York City when this uh, office was uh, proposed. And I want to thank Councillor Flynn for your leadership in trying to bring this to the city of Boston. Um, I represent high density uh, downtown neighborhoods, so East Boston. I'm um, thinking of the North End in particular with the amount of, of folks that live there in close proximity. There's a lot of trash. We have a lot of restaurants that provide organic waste, which is what the rats love. So always making sure that trash and rats, it's an it's a in tandem conversation. Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot of construction and development that's happening in my neighborhoods as well. So I am getting, this is probably one of the top issues that folks call my office on, is just the amount of, of pests and rats that they see. They're asking if somebody from ISD can, can come out. And God love the ISD department because they really are trying to be everywhere. And I know that there's you know, certain investments that are coming down the pike to make sure they, they have more staff capacity. But I do think that this is a great idea to streamline and, and coordinate a, a, a response and a process. Um, and this really is the nuts and bolts uh, uh, issue um, that, that 
uh, we should be, be focusing in on. This is what I absolutely love about municipal government. What are we doing wrong? What, we can, what can we do better to best serve the residents of our city? So I just want to say thank you to you, uh, Council President Flynn, for looping me in. Um, thank you to Inspectional Services for their work, Public Works, and then all of my neighbors uh, who put this um, in, in front of me and uplifted this issue. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coletta. Is anyone else uh, wishing to speak on this matter? Councillor Royal, we'll see where you are. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just want to thank uh, Council President Flynn and Councillor Coletta for moving forward with this. This has been an ongoing, long, uh, probably for as long as the city of Boston has been a city. Uh, we have dealt with pests, uh, and I think one of the things that has been sort of a reoccurring theme is that uh, there's a number of issues, whether it's how we get the dried ice and all of the different things to sort of address uh, the issue that we have with pests, specifically uh, rodents uh, in the city of Boston. Uh, some neighborhoods uh, bear the brunt of it more, depending on whether or not there's construction, whether or not they're heavy restaurant districts, uh, whether or not they're, they're uh, downtown, frankly, near the tunnels. Uh, but all neighborhoods uh, have issues with pests, and specifically with rodents, especially uh, it seems like uh, we've had an increase in, in sort of the last five years, at least, in terms of the amount of complaints that we have uh, so I commend this. I think there's a, a solution uh, and a way towards a, a sort of more permanent solution. So I'm very uh, grateful to Council President Flynn for his leadership on this uh, and Councilor Coletta for moving forward on this. I think it's an important issue. I think people think it's funny when you say a rat SAR, but these are the kinds of things that make a real change in people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis, especially if you are managing restaurants and you have a large amount of waste and you are neighbors who live in that area. Uh, these are the kinds of things that really increase the quality of your life. Uh, keep our communities healthy, uh, and so I'm grateful to them both for having their eye on the city's well-being. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Royo. Councillor Bach. Thank you so much, um, Madam Chair, and just in my final meeting as a chair of the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology, um, a chair which I was proud to take after Councillor Flynn, who had it uh, in the prior session. Um, just wanted to thank him for his leadership on this and also say that, you know, I really think this is a great idea. I think, you know, what we have increasingly done as the committee is pull together Public Works and ISD and Boston Water and Sewer and all these agencies and had them come before us for this for the same hearings because we got frustrated with always hearing like, oh no, it's technically in the other jurisdiction. And I think that's been really productive for the council committee. But the reality is we only have council hearings every like few months on this topic. And so I think, you know, the idea of really stitching the departmental work together and having somebody who's accountable and in charge is really great. I also just really want to lift up that how much I think that interdepartmental approach is important, especially now that I think we're increasingly recognizing the central role of public works and trash management in this conversation and I'm thrilled about the acceleration of the compost pilot so that we're not just doing another 10,000 families next year but actually this coming year but actually 20,000 um, because fundamentally if we can get that organic food waste that is what the rats are going for um, out of the trash that's that's what's going to really turn this problem around we can we can downstream try to kill rats as much as we want but fundamentally we have to remove the food source um, if we want to make a serious dent in this problem so um, just really uh, grateful to Councillor Flynn for his leadership um, and certainly can volunteer the Boston Housing Authority to participate in partnership with any uh, rats are should they be so named so thank you and please add my name thank you Councillor Bob Councillor Flaherty uh, thank you Madam Chair uh, please uh, add my name uh, to this and in, uh, in addition obviously to the czar and to eliminating the food source which uh, speaking to uh, our pest control uh, rodent control uh, division they're saying that uh, it's dog feces is now becoming uh, sort of the meal of choice for, uh, for rats. So we know that they're burrowed under our parks, our playgrounds, uh, backyards. They get into homes, into commercial residents. I think a big piece of the solution is in the whole dry ice conundrum. Um, completely illogical. Uh, someone has patented uh, under the guise, I think, of rat ice. But it's uh, completely illogical that uh, inspectional services have to drive to the North Shore. I think it's to Woburn to get a specific type of label. They then have to turn around, drive back through Boston and out to Rockland to get the dry ice, and then turn around and then come back into. So uh, something has to be done at that level, and I don't know if that's uh, at the city or the state or a combination of city and the state level, but uh, for the city of Boston to be able to, to use dry ice, uh, they used to actually be able to, before it was patented, they used to be able to get it over it, um, uh, over in the, um, 
um, or the meatpacking uh, meat packing district. Um, and, um, and as a result of now this new situation where we're, we've got a team of folks going to the North Shore and then a team of folks going to the South Shore, um, complete insanity. So uh, look forward to an expedited hearing. Look forward to, lead, uh, to working with the lead sponsors. But it's a solvable problem if you identify clearly the food sources. But if we're able to use uh, dry ice uh, in its full capacity um, expeditiously, we'll be able to uh, put a significant uh, dent in the Norwegian rat. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Flaherty. Um, Councillor Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and also, just please add my name. Uh, I want to thank Councillor Council President Flynn and Councillor Coletta for their work here on whether we get um, and uh, excited for the conversation. I will just say that I think an important equation also to this issue is, um, and as an at-large city councilor seeing it in Charlestown, seeing it in Mattapan, seeing it in High Park, a large part of the issue is dumpster maintenance and absentee landlords not taking care of their dumpsters. And I think a, a huge part of the work of the rat czar will be in working with our absentee landlords, our corporate landlords, that allow our neighborhoods to be overrun with dumpsters that then become the feeding grounds for these rats. So I just want to make sure that that um, is, a, is a centered part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Louis and Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Um, I just also want to stand and thank the sponsors of this. I'm often reluctant to add another level of government, but having the hearings and being at the hearings so far, seeing that so many departments are affected and they're working so closely together, I think it is such a public health quality of life issue that we do need to have one person managing all that intergovernmental cooperation, which I know the departments who have come before us, ISD, property management, public works, transportation, BHA, I hope to see you on the other side soon, um, Councillor Bach, um, the Housing Department, Streets Department, so many different departments know that they can be part of the solution. So I do believe that this is a good idea. So put add my name, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, I'd also like to make a few comments as the District Councillor for D District 9, Austin Brighton. Uh, the rodent issue and uh, is probably one of the most the highest frequency number of calls that we get uh, from residents, long-established residents and, and uh, renters in our in our neighbourhoods. It's not just um, it's so so distressing when rats actually end up getting into homes and and apartment buildings. Uh, we have we have a lot of work to do in terms of compliance and enforcement, and I really welcome. Thank you, Councillor Flynn and Councillor Coletta, for proposing this uh, this uh, this hearing to discuss the the idea of a, an office of pest control in the city of Boston. It's really past due, as I said in many times. This is our we've had a perennial hearing every year. We go in and we have the same conversation, but we really need to try and move the needle on this. So thank you so much for your leadership. Um, would, uh, uh, who all's, uh, just take a, ha a count on who all's adding their name. Councillor Arroyo, um, Councillor Bach, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor uh, Louis Jean, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Morel, Councillor Braden. Thank you so much. Docket 0832 will be referred to the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Mr. Quirk, could I take um, another docket out of order? Could we, could we go to 0835, please? Docket number 0835, Council of Louisiana and Bach offer the following. Resolution urging Mass General Brigham to demonstrate a commitment to labor harmony for a fair NLRB election process. Okay. Um, the chair recognizes Councilor Louis Jean. Councilor Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to request to, to suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Braden as an original co sponsor. Having hearing no objection, uh, Councilor Braden is added. The chair recognizes Councilor Louis Jean. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, like we were saying, I was saying earlier regarding our municipal employees and, and making sure that we are providing a minimum um, uh, wage there that is livable. 
and we want to do that to set an example for our, our employers here in the city. Um, that is true for our doctor trainees, for the doctor, for the fellows, the interns, and the residents at Mass General Brigham. On April 4th, after months of organizing that was not easy and it's really busy, busy schedules, one of the reasons why they're unionizing, residents and fellows at MGB Mass General Brigham filed a petition with the NLRB to unionize. This is good news as MGB is the largest employer here in the Commonwealth with approximately 75,000 employees across the state and it has the largest residency program on the East Coast. Um, the proposed unionization includes residents and fellows across all MGB specialties and professions and is the largest NLRB filing for a house staff bargaining unit. That was very evident um, earlier this week when we stood in front of Mass General Brigham in partnership um, with the residents and the fellows and uh, union brothers and sisters around this city standing in solidarity with all of you. I want to thank Coralie for all of the work that you've done uh, with SEIU and um, uh, and org helping to get folks organized. MGB residents and, and fellows are still currently fighting for formal recognition uh, th for this bargaining unit for a real seat at the table and to advocate for improved working conditions, wages, and patient care. Um, MGB could choose to voluntarily recognize the union and they have chosen not to. And so we wanna just make it clear that we stand in solidarity with all of you. Um, you work incredibly long hours um, giving um, health care to our residents across uh, the city um, and sometimes you have to endure poor working conditions, sleeping on yoga mats during uh, after 16 hour shifts um, and struggling to make ends meet. This step will help build a system um, that not only uh, ensures uh, the safety and well-being of our physicians but also takes a look at our health care industry in general. We were talking earlier the resolution uh, filed in partnership with my co-sponsors Coletta and Mejia about the need to make sure that we are we have a health system that really does the work of meeting health care for every single person regardless of status and so much of our health care system is based on profit and not recognizing individuals as people in need of rest in need of full healing and as, as being more than just cogs in a wheel. Um, so we can't forget that doctors were also on the front lines during the pandemic taking care of our residents and it's our turn to stand with them and to make sure our collective voices are heard. Um, as someone who cares deeply about the city, about health care, about um, improving working conditions, as I, as I know my colleagues do, i um, honored to file this resolution alongside my colleagues. And you know, we in here at Boston have a rich history of standing with our work with our workers, and I see no reason why that should not be uh, the situation today. So I'm asking my colleagues to join with me, and uh, hope that we can uh, pass uh, this resolution, uh, do a suspend and pass today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Lujan. The chair recognizes Council Block. Council Block, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President, um, and thank you to Councilors Lujan and Braden. Um, as the councilor uh, for both Mass General and Brigham, I just wanted to. Um, rise and add my voice in support um, of uh, our workers uh, who are fighting to unionize. And you know, I think for those of us who believe that every worker needs a union, um, that means we mean every worker. And I think that you know, there are certain systems. You know, pe not everybody realizes that residents are called that because there was this like original history of them literally living in the hospitals. Um, and I think there's like some kind of old legacy systems here that like almost have a kind of hazing approach towards this work where it's like, look, this is just a really hard thing that you get through um, and then you get out the other side. But you know, for a lot of our trainees, it's just, it's, it's not a livable work environment um, and it can create a situation where we, you know, lose potential great doctors along the way because we haven't put the parameters around the work to really make it livable and to, um, and to support them and have them become the best doctors that they can be and provide the best level of care to our patients. Um, so, you know, to me, um, you know, labor management partnership at its best is always a win-win, like it results in better work environments and a better experience for the, in this case, the patient. Um, and, you know, I really think that there's an enormous opportunity here. Um, and so definitely um, want to join my colleagues in, in urging a sort of labor harmony approach from MGB and, and a move towards a fair NLRB election here. And again, would love to have colleagues support um, in a suspension and passage today. Um, and if that were to be successful, Mr. President, it, uh, 
a, potentially a photograph if you were to indulge us. So yep. thank you, Mr. President. Thank, thank you, Councilor Block. The Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as a healthcare professional, um, I'm really proud to stand and support the interns and residents and fellow uh, physicians and from Mass General uh, Brigham. Um, as as Councilor Bach has already mentioned, this arduous and grueling uh, trainee process is is a really sort of a very sort of antiquated and long-standing practice in our healthcare systems all over the world. I, I witnessed it myself when I was uh, working in the healthcare system in, in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, the notion that you, we have to put our trainee physicians through uh, this ringer, this, this ringer of working over 80 hours a week, uh, sleep deprived, uh, unable to have you know, a couple of days off at a time, um, is sort of inhuman. And it also is very detrimental. We're supposed to be health and wellness is about getting uh, getting uh, self care, good sleep, able to eat on a regular basis. Uh, our our own our own general population need need all those things that are essential to our health and well being. Uh, no no less our um, our trainee physicians in in the healthcare system. So um, I really am very proud to stand with my uh, uh, fellow. Uh, Healthcare professionals over on the on the over here and support them and ask that their um, uh, organising efforts be be handled uh, appropriately and fairly, uh, and that they actually have some recognition that it doesn't have to be this way. We can have a much more humane uh, approach to uh, our, uh, ha uh, working with our trainee physicians, so that they continue to be. Uh, able to continue their career, be successful and fully fledged um, physicians uh, and, and continue. So many, as Councillor Bach has already mentioned, so many physicians actually, especially women and uh, 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 physicians in training who have family commitments, uh, decide to go somewhere else and take their talents and their, their commitment to um, humanity they take it somewhere else because of the grueling nature of, of physician training. So I hold, I'm very honoured to stand in support of them today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. Councillors, well, would anyone else like to speak in this matter? The, the Chair recognises Council of Royal. Council of Royal, you have the floor. Thank you. I'll be brief. I just want to stand in support. Uh, I think it's vital to make clear that in professions like this, and frankly in all professions, uh, you perform better when you're healthy, you perform better under healthy, uh, uh, healthy sort of guidance and guidelines for how we should operate within our organizations, whether it's a city council or whether it's a hospital. Uh, and in a situation where you have a job that uh, everything requires human interaction, interacting with other people, uh, and making really important decisions and making really important diagnoses, uh, it's really important that we make sure that our hospitals are doing their very best to uplift and support mental health, to uplift and support good rest and well rest. We get all of this data and all of this uh, evidence-backed uh, study on what sleep means to people, what uh, emotional and mental health means to people, and the ways in which uh, we operate differently and, in fact, detrimentally when that happens. And when we are talking about the care of those individuals themselves who are providing this service to us, especially I think the pandemic has brought to light just how difficult those, that kind of service can be. But when we have folks who are providing that kind of service on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it's not just important to keep them healthy, but it's important to recognize that the keeping them healthy and keeping them happy and making sure that you are treating the whole employee actually trickles down to how they treat the people before them and the folks who are interacting with our hospitals, which then trickles into our communities and our families and who's benefiting from uh, that. And the, the truth is the only person who benefits is all of us. And so it's really important that we do uh, the things that we can do to protect our workers, especially in the health profession. I went to law school and we all knew about sort of how grueling uh, med school students had it when they first came out. We would complain about our similarly based loans. Uh, so hopefully something happens on that. But in terms of uh, when we talk about the actual uh, sort of uh, hazing ritual of what it is to be a young physician, I, I think it's clear that there are better, more efficient ways to do this and that failure to act on this is actually a failure to uplift uh, patient care. And so uh, it is my hope that they do so uh, swiftly and that it becomes a template for how we do work in all of our hospitals. So thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Royal. The Chair recognizes Councillor Mejia. Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and I just want to rise and support and thank my colleagues for bringing this resolution to the forefront. I often think that we uh, have this illusion and belief of what a doctor is, and we always think, oh my God, they make thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, right? Um, but when you hear stories like this and you hear what this moment is requiring us to do is to support you all um, so that you could have the type of dignity and working environment that is suitable, right? And so I just want to affirm and let you know that I see you, I support you, and um, please add my name. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Coletta, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Council Mejia, Council Murphy, Council Worrell, please add the chair. Um, I, I would add very briefly that this body, this city council body, has always stood for the rights of working men and women, the rights of unions, <coughs> the right to collective bargaining. We support these medical professionals in their quest to organize. We support uh, hospital and hotel workers, restaurant workers, and our low-wage security offices. <coughs> here in the city of Boston too. So it's about working together and making sure workers are treated with respect and dignity. <clears throat> Council, Lu Council Louis-Jean, Council Bach, Council Braden, seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0835. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. Uh, could my colleagues please come forward for a photo? Could the medical professionals please come forward as well? Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Clerk, we're back on schedule. We're on docket 0833. Docket number 0833, Councilors Bach and Flynn offer the following. Resolution designating a, designating a citizen square at the intersection of Boylston and Dartmouth Streets in Back Bay in recognition of Lieutenant Colonel Enoch Woody Woodhouse. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, and. Uh, this means a lot to me um, because uh, so we're recognizing um, Enoch Woodhouse today, although he's better known for me uh, as Woody and for many of us, and he's my constituent. Uh, and actually, he was a focus of my maiden speech um, that I gave in February 2020, uh, a month before the pandemic hit. Um, and so I thought that today, uh, in my remarks on this docket, I would actually just pull some of the um, things that I said about Woody uh, back in February 2020, because they remain just as true today, except that it's three years later, and now instead of 93, he is 96. Um, he is still with us. Uh, he's a little under the weather today, so resting up. We were hoping to have him here, um, but he's still doing great, and he's resting up in part for a trip this weekend, um, so still uh, going strong and just really one of the legends of um, Boston. So I'll just um, read some of those remarks of mine from three years back. And then I'm um, proud to be co-sponsoring this with Councillor Flynn. Um, 
Woody is my constituent in Mission Hill, but uh, the square that we were honoring uh, in at Copley Square um, is actually in Councillor Flynn's district, um, and so the Veterans uh, Commission reached out to both of us, which I'm grateful for. And I, I do want to recognize Commissioner Santiago just for all of the work. He was, he was going to be Woody's ride today, um, and he just does so much work day in, day out for all of our veterans, um, whether they're our super famous ones like our Tuskegee Airmen or... Um, or just any any veteran uh, here in our community. So um, this was from, and for a little bit of context, my maiden speech was actually about cooperatives, um, housing cooperatives dot my district. Uh, they're all over from Fenway to the West End Place to Charles Bank in uh, Mission Hill, which is where Woody lives. And so I've left out the bit about co-ops today. I just want to talk about Woody, but um, for folks wondering, uh, that was kind of the, housing cooperatives was the focus of my first speech here in this body. Today, um, I want to highlight Enoch Woodhouse, or Woody, a resident of the Charles Bank Cooperative, uh, who turned, well, in February it was 93, just a couple weeks ago, it's now 96. Um, and, uh, you know, as we enter Black History Month in 2020, we could stand to learn a lot from a man born in the 1920s, someone who still gives so much to our community. Woody grew up here in Boston, raised in the Roxbury Housing Projects. After he graduated from English High in 1944, he enlisted. He served as a Tuskegee Airman, part of the community that shamed President Truman into integrating the armed forces by defending our nation in uniform even when it didn't see fit to treat them as equal citizens. Woody was kicked off a train on his first trip south to training camp for the color of his skin. I once heard him muse about why such experiences hadn't embittered him, why they instead stoked his resolve to break down barriers. I think it's because Woody had been raised in love and faith to know for sure that his dignity was his own and couldn't be threatened. He wears that dignity as easily as he inhabits his skin, and that self-assurance means he's always been ready to stretch out a hand to others. Woody went to officer candidate school and became Lieutenant Colonel Woodhouse. He later attended Yale and then BU Law School. He served in JAG, practiced law in the city, worked for the State Department, and at one point worked as Assistant Corporation Counsel for Boston. Um, here. So again, in the same story department, we were honoring Henry Lutine a few minutes ago. Um, Woody was here working on our behalf. He's been a pathbreaker at every stage of his life. He was also very involved in 1960 when Charles Bank was first built, um, not without a fight, uh, in Mission Hill as a limited equity co-op of 276 units stretching 24 stories tall. Um, it was actually done on BRA land, and I think in a moment where, again, we're talking about producing housing, um, in a context where you don't have as much federal money as you wish you had. Um, this was actually, I think, the very first redevelopment project in all of Boston that wasn't funded by federal money, where um, the city pulled together money to create this. And 60 years later, it has housed thousands of people from all walks of life, and it's one of the most vibrant residential communities in my district. It's a place people really know their neighbors um, and are very involved. And Woody is its most treasured resident. He's content now mostly to sit back and let others run the co-op meetings, um, but he's always there if you need historical context or a warning about the little course corrections required to keep a diverse, equitable, self-governing community on track. He's the conscience of the place, a blessing and example to all who know him, whether at Charles Bank or at Trinity Church where he and I worship together, um, or at one of the many other places where he astonishes at age 96 with his mix of infectious energy, lawyerly wit, and deep personal wisdom. Um, and just the last bit of this I was in my speech in 2020, and it's something I feel very keenly now as well. It, it should go without saying, but I will say it, Boston has to be a place where people can live their whole lives, a place with homes for our elders to share their wisdom with us, and homes for our little ones too, the other end of the age spectrum that is being driven out of Boston. When market logic takes over our housing stock, you get a city that only has homes for current high wage earners not the two ends of every life where we most feel our dependence on one another. To do that, to squeeze out our elders and our children, is community-destroying insanity. There has got to be a place not as a, not as a sort of inconvenient thing that happens to people, that their children and then they're elderly, but a recognition that that's a huge part of the, and the natural round of life, and we have to have places where people can afford to live as um, young ones and as, and as elders. Um, people might look at Charles Bank, where Woody lives, right on Huntington Ave, and see a tall tower. Uh, it looms so high, it might not occur to anyone to call it human scale. But human scale is not just five to six feet tall. Human scale is relational. So architecture that creates a home for community, that's human scale. And human scale is temporal. It's that human scale of time is a lifetime. 
So, you know, what we really need to create together is a Boston where people can live full lives in diverse communities. A Boston that's really that, at that human scale, even when, as with Woody, the humans in question are larger than life. Um, so I just really want to um, today mark Woody Woodhouse as one of those larger than life humans among us, somebody who teaches us what a life of service looks like um, as a veteran, uh, but also um, just what a significant meaningful life means in every aspect of his work. And I'm really, really excited for the moment that we'll put his square up and be able to know that whenever we're going to Copley Square, um, there's also that marky, marker of Woody here. So um, thank you. Thanks so much, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Bach. I will speak briefly on it. I think Councilor Bach said it, said it best in describing Lieutenant Colonel Woodhouse. During the pandemic, Lieutenant, Cur Lieutenant Colonel Woodhouse was a Lieutenant Colonel and I saw him two years later and he was promoted to general at the age of 88 or 89. I said, I said Colonel, how did you get promoted to, to general? He said, don't call me Colonel, call me general. So I said, okay, General, how did you get promoted? And he said he got a special, <coughs> special permission from the Army Secretary. So, so now we have to call him General and not Lieutenant Colonel. Um, but when I think of Lieutenant Colonel Woodhouse, I think of what, what is great about Boston. Here's, here's a African-American veteran serving our country like many African-American veterans did in World War II, Tuskegee Airmen, ser serving our country. Um, Willis Saunders, many of my council Flaherty knows, Willis Saunders, who was a superintendent on Boston Police. A lot of Boston, Boston men were Tuskegee Airmen, including the Lieutenant Colonel. But here they are, they were willing to lay down their life for our country in World War II, and then they come back to Boston and they're not treated and come back to the United States and they're not treated with, re with respect and they don't have the same, same rights as everybody else. But they continue serving our city, they continue serving our country and making our country better. And that's what I think about when I, when I see Lieutenant Colonel Woodhouse's a dedication, a commitment, service, sacrifice in helping people along the way. So. Thank you, Council of Block, for, for adding me. Would any, anyone else like to speak on this matter that she recognizes? Council Louis Jen. Council Louis Jen, you have the floor. Thank you, um, uh, President Flynn. I just uh, want to thank my colleagues for following this and ask to please add my name. Uh, uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel General Woodhouse <laughs> is a walking institution. I, I get, sometimes I can't believe he's 96 years old. I remember, you know as an at-large city council going from neighborhood to neighborhood. There was one morning I was at an event at 8 a.m. and he was there, and then I ended my last event at 7 p.m. and he was there. I was like, what, how can you keep the same schedule? Um, so I just am thankful that he is recognized when he probably needs to probably stay home and get some rest. But I'm, I'm grateful that he's been kept so long and that he continues to be a walking historian, um, what I call, um, a, a real legend here uh, could not have been, and you hear it from him all the time, easy being a black person in the Army, given um, his tenure and given everything that he's experienced. I was at a St. Patrick's Day event in Dorchester, and he pulled me aside to tell me all the work that he's done and tried to do in Haiti, which really just warmed my heart. And he talked about the story of, of liberation in Haiti and the work that he tried to do to really continue that um, and push that needle forward. And I just was further, um, enamored with him and everything that he's given this city and how he still finds time uh, to keep going. So I just ask, my prayer is that God continues to keep him um, in good health so that he can continue to teach all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Council Louis-Jean. The chair recognizes Council Murphy. Council Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. And I want to thank Veteran Services for making sure we're making a hero square for General Woodhouse. And also um, thank you, Council Bach, for taking the time on your last meeting to recognize him. He was one of the first constituents as an at-large city councilor. And um, like Council louis -Jean said, everywhere we go, we see him. I've walked out of Fairmont Copley, and there he is at 9 o'clock at night. And I've been seeing him here in the hallways at City Hall, oftentimes looking for Council President Flynn. But he, um, he talks to me if you're not available. Um, he's just a wonderful person. and. 
when you speak to him, you can just tell he's full of love and he's just what, you know, what the city to me is all about. The history he tells you in a five, 10 minute conversation is something that's so important. And I know that the Veteran Services has recorded a lot of it. It's something that they're doing, making sure that we talk to our old, older veterans. Um, my dad and my um, stepdad are two of them that making sure that we're, we're hearing their stories and we're capturing them because once they're gone, I don't want those stories to be gone with them. So I'm looking forward to the celebration when we um, make the hero square for him and hope he's resting up and just want to send my love to him. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. The chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, President Flynn. I also uh, am really excited that we have some something official happening for General Woodhouse. Uh, I think there's something really special uh, about individuals like him uh, and others who have served, who have served knowing that they are serving in a country that does not fully respect their being or their humanity and has made it harder for them to both serve uh, and to thrive uh, and have made it their goal to make this country more representative and more reflective of what it should be uh, and who believe in the promise of this country enough to serve in a manner where they are making or potentially making the ultimate sacrifice. And so uh, for folks like General Woodhouse, uh, who did this at a time where it was even more difficult uh, to do so uh, and serve courageously and with honor and dignity, this is uh, a wonderful tribute for him. Uh, and I'm really grateful that he is getting it. Uh, and so I commend uh, all who were involved in that, but most especially himself, uh, for earning this distinction uh, today. So thank you. Thank you, Council Royo. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, please uh, add my name to Woody's resolution. Thank the lead sponsor. Uh, Woody is a fountain of knowledge and experience. Uh, doesn't miss a trick. Yeah. I know he's watching, so hopefully he feels better <laughs> and look forward to seeing him at the dedication of a hero script. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clark, please add Council Royal, Council Baker. Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lujan, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Rell. Councilors Bach and Flynn seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0833. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, we're on to docket 0834, please. Docket number 0834, Councilors Bark and Lujan offer the following. Resolution recognizing May as National Preservation Month. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Council Bark. Council Bark, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. President. And Mr. President, may I um, suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Braden as an original co-sponsor? Hearing no objection, Council Braden is added. The Chair recognizes Council Bark. Thank you so much. Um, I, and thank you, you know, it's a few days before May. Often we do these in the actual month, but um, since I'm not gonna be here for the first May meeting, I wanted to make sure to um, recognize National uh, uh, Historic Preservation Month um, and, uh, and shout out to the Boston Preservation Alliance. Um, and really, like, really say what an important thing I think it is for a city like Boston um, to take historic preservation uh, really seriously. It wasn't that long ago that, you know, when they built this building, the assumption was that we were gonna knock down old city hall because we didn't need it anymore. Um, and it was only actually by some like pretty belated everybody pulling together that that building was saved um, over on School Street. Um, and I think about how much it means to us to still have it and actually we'll be um, going a little bit uh, later after the meeting, I've invited all of my colleagues to join me over at the Old State House, which is also Old City Hall. It was the City Hall from 1830 to 1840. Um, and, uh, you know, I just think that those, uh, those built markers are really important to chronicling the city's history. Um, but in particular, one of the things that we've been talking about more and more over the last few years is the importance of making sure that we're really doing historic preservation for all of our communities um, and that we're preserving the really um, important sites and markers for our black communities, our immigrant communities, um, the stories that don't get told as much. Um, even when we're talking about Revolutionary War stuff, we've got um, as much, if not more, revolutionary history in Dorchester, Roxbury, Hyde Park in this city as we do downtown. Um, and those haven't always been the stories that we've told and the sites that we've highlighted. 
Um, and so, you know, as we as we move towards America's 250th in 2026, and then the city's 400th in 2030, I um, think it's you know really important for Boston to remember that one of the things that makes us different from a lot of American cities is our history. Um, and it's part of what draws tourists here, and it's part of what gives us as a city our sense of identity. And we want that identity to be really inclusive, and we want there to be resources for historic preservation, again, in all of our neighborhoods. Um, so I just wanted to put a few things kind of on the record and on the agenda um, on that front. So one of them is, you know, I think there really needs to be a, a look in again at Article 85. That's the demolition delay um, piece. And it's come up again and again in this chamber because it's very frustrating for all concerned right now. It starts a 90-day clock. But from a developer perspective, it tends to just be like another added layer of um, time wasting. And then from the preservation community, it's not really affecting what it's supposed to, which is a real effort to do adaptive reuse um, and look at how to save a building. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity to rethink that. And I also think that as the city rethinks Article 80, there's an opportunity to unpack Article 80 in a way that actually really like um, pushes folks towards adaptive reuse and thinks about the ways in which we can put our wonderful buildings that hold so many of our uh, city's memories to great new uses. And I know in my neighborhood, a lot of the affordable housing on Beacon Hill is actually in old schools of the cities. And so thinking about, you know, it's not about preserving everything in amber and nothing changes. The city's got to grow and the city's got to have new uses, but thinking about really proactively, how do we have resources for that? The other thing is it's, you know, it's come up, how do we make it so that more folks in all of our communities can apply for CPA historic preservation grants and that those don't just go to folks where you already have an endowment and a board around a building. Um, so more technical assistance on that is something I know that Thadine and her team have started to work on. Um, I think there's still an argument for a real citywide historic survey so that we actually go out proactively and look at the important resources in all of our neighborhoods instead of re relying on the squeaky wheels. Um, and I think the kind of inclusive commemoration related to these upcoming um, uh, anniversaries can help us can help us get there. Um, so I just, you know, I just wanted to highlight that set of things because it's a May is a historic preservation month to celebrate all the things we have preserved in Boston, but there's lots more work to do, um, and uh, and I think it's very important um, to upholding the city's history and really telling all of our stories, our indigenous stories, our um, black stories, our immigrant stories. Um, Boston. Uh, has always been that kind of rich tapestry all the way back. So uh, thank you, Mr. President, and, um, and I would ask uh, for the council support and suspension and passage of this resolution today. Thank you, Councilor Bork. The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden? Councilor Okay. The chair recognizes Council Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to uh, Councillor Bach for uh, again one of this, like, these last filings um, today honoring May as National Preservation Month. Uh, obviously, pre preserving our history, whether we're, we're uh, marking a particular moment or just recognizing the importance of uh, all the different people who make up our city. Um, is is it doesn't happen without the dedication of, of folks making sure that this history is uplifted. You know, we just talked about uh, General Woodhouse and why it's important to name the square after him, recognizing him as a Tuskegee Airman um, and all that he's given our city. Uh, we did it more recently in, in re recognizing Christmas Addicts Day. Um, we're doing it when we recognize uh, the indigenous land in which we stand and thinking about um, uh, when we're thinking about Long Island, thinking about the sensitivity uh, to the historic uh, uh, centrality of a place like that to our indigenous uh, residents. So the preservation of history must be inclusive. And I also want to shout out to Thady and Brown, who's done a, a, a really good job and continues to do a good job to make sure that other communities um, are able to make use of the Community Preservation Act, working with my office um, to make sure that the First Haitian Baptist Church, a church where I grew up, um, that is a historic landmark, has the funds necessary uh, to maintain the building um, on the Roxbury Dorchester line, oftentimes money that they don't, wouldn't otherwise have. We as a city, we're home to many iconic landmarks, um, including the Black Heritage Trail, the USS Constitution Museum, the Freedom Trail, places where MLK lived, um, Jazz Square, the corner of uh, Tremont and Columbus, uh, paying homage to the Hi-Hat, the Wigwam, uh, which are no longer there, but we do still have Wally's, the longest running family-owned jazz club in the country. 
Um, and so these landmarks remind us of our rich history, um, the history of abolition, emancipation, but also more recent um, history of, of persecution and discrimination are important landmarks um, in our city that we must preserve in order to truly move forward. We always have to look back uh, in homage to one of our, the, our latest inclusions, um, the Embrace Monument, which really uh, not only tries to pay homage to the importance of Coretta Scott King and Martin Luther King, but to all the freedom fighters here in our city who have made uh, the makeup of this body, who have made the makeup of this city what it is. So celebrating preservation is not only about historical significance, it's about how we can bring economic um, benefits to all of our neighborhoods as a walking, my first job again as a walking tour guide uh, in Roxbury and in the South End, there's so much richness in our neighborhoods where they were talking about Camp Meigs and Hyde Park with the 54th Regiment trained um, or um, other places throughout our city uh, there are underappreciated and underutilized historical sites that could attract tourism. Um, and yesterday, a uh, budget hearing, we talked about this and how we need to make sure that we are putting more money into that office if we want to make sure that we are centering our neighborhoods and their ability to be these beacons of tourism um, for our city. So um, as we celebrate this month, I look forward to working together to ensure that all uh, of our neighborhoods and future generations can enjoy our cultural treasures here in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Louis-Jean. The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Councilor Bach and Councilor Louis-Jean for including me as a, an original co-sponsor. Um, as a longtime member of the Brighton and Alston Historical Society, this is an issue very close to my heart. Um, uh, the the Alston Brighton Historical Society, uh, before the pandemic used to do a walking tour of in and around Brighton Centre and they had a binder full of uh, photographs and, and uh, maps uh, that listed and uh, accounted for many, many historic structures that were demolished over the years and are lost. Uh, and uh, I think it's really important to think about the local significance uh, and uh, thank you to Councillor Bach for uh, really pushing to have, you know, a historic um, structures and locations, if they have a state or federal significance, then there's protections there. But if they have local significance, we do not have a lot of protection at the moment. So we really want to keep working on that. Uh, what is significant um, in, locally has to be decided by the population, the local population, what they see as important. Um, I, you know, when I arrived in Alston Brighton years ago, uh, we used to drive past the, the, the old Speedway. It was an old former state police uh, station. It was the former headquarters of the Speedway that had a trotting uh, track around uh, down on, off Soldiers Field Road. And every time we drove past, my partner would say, oh my goodness, I hope they save that place. Uh, somebody's going to set it on fire and it's going to burn down to the ground. But thankfully, through, through the good offices of um, uh, our uh, local representative, uh, Senate Major uh, House Majority Leader, uh, Michael Moran had it on his to-do list to try and save that structure. So um, through um, working with Historic Boston, the, the whole place has been renovated, and it is a brew pub, and all sorts of great things are happening there. And it is um, totally rejuvenated. The, or the original architectural structure is preserved, and it's become a community, a community place to gather, which is an incredibly uh, beautiful thing. It's well activated and, and has been well used. So that's just one instance that just something that looks old and decrepit doesn't mean that it can't be restored to be, become a, compu a very important community asset. So I'm very happy to support this, uh, this resolution today and recognize uh, the National Historic Preservation Month. And uh, I think we have a lot of work to do. And uh, I hope that we can continue to just keep advocating. Just back to one other issue that Councillor Bach has mentioned, the Article 85 90-day uh, demolition delay. Um, very often, developers apply for, a demo, they apply for a demolition permit, and they're given a 90-day delay. And they're supposed to have presented a serious um, adaptive use uh, alternative to demolishing. And very often, it's just like a sort of a token exercise, not a really serious uh, effort to try and preserve uh, a structure. And they're basically just running the clock out so that they can demolish it. And very often, we're losing so much of our historic fabric all across the city uh, that we need to be more mindful 
in terms of pre preserving these uh, these historic uh, structures. They are the th they are the structures and the places that add character to our city and uh, make it an interesting and and uh, very vital place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. <coughs> Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Jumping the gun a little bit. Um, would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Kirk, please add Councillor Royo, Councillor Cleta, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Rao, please add the chair. Councillor Bach, Councillor Louis Jean, and Councillor Braden seek suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0834. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. We did the next docket already. We did the following one. We're on to, is it docket 0837? Mr. Mr. Clark, please read docket 0837. Docket number 0837, Councilor Mejia offered the following. Resolution calling on Boston Public Schools for community engagement and full transparency in the ongoing efforts to close and merge public schools. Thank you, the Chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to add my colleague, Council Worrell from District 4, who also represents the school that I'm about to uplift. Council Worrell has added that she recognizes Council Mejia. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, before I even start diving into this, I kind of want to just level set for people to understand that back in the day during white flight, when our schools were depleted of every single resource, you know, black and brown families did not have the means to be able to just send their kids to parochial school. And some of us did not know about other opportunities. And so, you know, when I think about the history and education here in the city of Boston, I think about the immense uh, lack of investments that we have made in our Boston public education system. And as a parent, a BPS parent, a BPS graduate, and a education activist, I have seen time and time and time again that parents and people who are stakeholders who are always up in arms about the things that they want to see in their schools are always the last um, to be heard and oftentimes they are an afterthought. And so we have all of these moving pieces and people that show up and speak on our behalf and oftentimes do so with so much conviction and passion and you have to ask yourself, what do they really know? So, this particular instance here, the Green New Deal, the Boston Public Schools is a long-term facilities action plan that includes major capital projects that will affect at least 20 school communities. These district-wide initiatives intend to address environmental concerns within our school facilities and expand educational opportunities for students. Some of the capital projects include closing and merging several public schools in the next few years. The process to merge schools has begun with the Sumner and Philbrick schools in Rosendale, the Shaw and Taylor schools in Dorchester and Mattapan, and the Hyde Park-based uh, Boston uh, Community Leadership Academy and the Dorchester-based McCormick School. BPS will likely continue to consolidate small school communities into larger new ones, or renovated buildings, necessitating more school closures and mergers. Such decisions impact our school communities greatly, and it is the responsibility of the Boston Public Schools to communicate any proposal to close or merge schools and make the public um, the reasons for these schools and not other schools should be closed or consolidated. Moreover, in the event that schools are to be closed or consolidated in anticipation of better facilities for students, construction projects should be completed before schools are closed or merged. In the absence of an elected school committee, there is no governance body for BPS that is directly accountable to the families. Therefore, direct communication and engagement with school communities is imperative at a systems-wide level. It is the responsibility of the Boston City Council to ensure that the City of Boston and the Boston Public Schools are engaging the community in the decision-making process and offering full transparency to the changes. 
Therefore, I ask my colleagues to join me in calling the Boston Public Schools for community engagement and full transparency in the ongoing efforts to close and merge public schools. This includes, one, providing a list of all the school closings since 2010 by neighborhood, type of school, size, student demographics, the reasoning for these closings, and the impact on marginalized students as specified in the racial equity planning tool that they have committed to. Two, provide data on the students attending any school proposed for closure or merger who have experienced the trauma of previous school closings as included in the equity impact analysis. And three, all school community meetings about closures and consolidation must be advertised at least 10 days in advance and conducted in multiple languages and childcare must be provided. In regards to these mergers, it's gotten so bad that um, as an at-large city councilor, not only am I the chair of education, but I also happen to be a busybody. And one of the things that I do is not just talk about it, I do something about it. So rolling up my sleeves is a part of the work. So I've been working with um, the Sumner uh, School, literally training their parents, the Latino Spanish speaking parents about parent councils and what is happening around these mergers. Right, so there's one thing to hold the district accountable, and then there's the other to actually do the work uh, to help uh, support those uh, situations. So now the students at the sum, the parents at the Sumner, the Spanish-speaking ones, understand what a parent council is. They understand what their role is. They also understand what their rights are. So now they're being engaged in the process. And I uplift this um, because I think it's really important for us to recognize the difference um, in terms of tactic. Uh, that, that we see here at play oftentimes when there's issues happening in our Boston public schools. Because the only way we're really gonna change things is if we actually dive into the issues and work in community and identify other viable solutions. It's all great and dandy to go back to Band-Aid solutions when we're at a moment in time when we could be more innovative. And that is what I'm asking the district to do, is to be innovative in their approach. And I'm asking the community to lead the conversation. Thank you. Th thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The Chair recognizes Council Rell. Council Rell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn, and thank you to Council Mejia for filing this. I also want to uh, thank the advocates, uh, Barbara Fields, and the many school advocates, and the families who have been lending their voices um, to this merger um, engagement process. Um, Boston, Boston school mergers need to be a collaborative process that centers the opinions of students, teachers, and parents. Uh, neglecting to engage with any of these groups will jeopardize a school's ability to effectively serve the students. Uh, when considering school closures and mergers, it becomes even more critical for BPS to actively seek out, engage with, and incorporate the opinions and perspective of all st stakeholders especially those affected students and families. As, um, as BPS works and becomes responsive to changes in student populations, it is imper imperative that they prioritize equity and ensure that any decision made is not disproportionately impacting historically marginalized communities. As, as policymakers, it is our responsibility to make difficult decisions with a deep understanding of their scope and impact. Uh, we must work to ensure that we are acting in the best interest of all students Particularly, particularly those who have historically been underserved and that our decisions are grounded in community and equity. And uh, what, I've heard, what I've been hearing in the, um, um, in the engagement process is that the, that the process is feeling rushed um, and that families' opinions and students' um, opinions are not feeling heard. So I'd like to have um, the merger process, at, at least for um, the Shaw and Taylor, be slowed down quite a bit and that um, the dates be moved out. Um, and I look to having the support of the council and voting in support of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Council Rell. The chair, anyone else like to speak? The chair recognizes Council Mejia. I mean, I'm sorry, Council Louis Jen. Council Louis Jen, you have the floor. Thank you. I also just rise to say that it's important that we get these merger, uh, these mergers right. As an alum of the Taylor, as someone whose niece who goes to the Taylor, and as someone, as Council Mejia was talking about the work that she's been doing with Latino parents, and my office has been working with. Um, my father founded the parent council um, at the Taylor School, that we work in conjunction with those communities that are in need of so much, including for more slight classrooms, I'll say it ad nauseum, for our students with limited um, and formal inter, uh, limited um, 
and interrupted formal education that we get it right, that um, as we are thinking about what the merger looks like, that parents, administrators, and students are centered in the conversation in my office is, is, has been doing that work and want to make sure that um, one of the things that we don't do so well is communicating to parents and families what we think the benefits of the merger will be and why the mergers must happen before we have a new physical structure. And I think it's important that we try to get the comms piece of this right to build trust in a lot of communities where that trust has been lost. Just wanted to make sure that I um, put that on the record as, um, as, as these mergers have the potential of being both disruptive for our students and transformative, um, it's important that we get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lujan. Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your, please raise your hand. Mr. Kerr, can you please add Council Royal, Council Bar, Council Braden, Council Coletta, Council Louisian? Please add the chair. Council Mejia, Council Rell. See expansion of the rules and passage of docket 0837. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. We're on to, per we're on to personnel orders. Mr. Clark, please read docket 0838. Docket number 0838, Council of Flynn for Council of Bar. The Chair seeks suspension of rules and passage of docket 0838. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. We're on to late files. I, I'm informed by the clerk that there are four late file matters. These include absence letter from Council of Laura, two personnel orders, a resolution from Council of Baker. The late, file, the late file should be on everyone's desk. We'll take a vote to add these late file matters into the agenda. Um, I just want to make sure they're on everyone's desk. I'll take a couple of seconds. All those in favor of adding the late file matters into the agenda say aye. aye. Thank you. The late file matters have been added to the agenda. Mr. Clerk, the first late file matter into the agenda um, is a letter of absence from Council Lara. Dear Council uh, President Flynn, I am regretfully unable to attend today's council meeting. Though I am not there, I'd like to thank Councilor Kenzie Bach for her nearly four years of service to the people of Boston. As chair of the Housing and Community Development Committee, I look forward to working in tandem as she enters her new role at the Boston Housing Authority. If her commitment to poor and working class people pro proves to be as strong as her commitment to the political institution, we're in good hands. A member of my staff will be present to take notes and report to me as needed. I look forward to reviewing the recordings of the meeting. Councillor Kendra Lara. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, please read the second late file matter, um, which, is a, which is a personnel order. Personnel order, Councillor Flynn for Councillor Bach. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this second late file matter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket is passed. Yeah. Mr. Clerk, can I revisit the um, previous late file matter, the letter from Council Lara? Can we please place that on file? We're on to the next late file matter, which is also a personnel order. Personnel order, Council of Flynn for Council of Bach. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. The final late file matter is a resolution from Councilor Baker for a flag raising. Um, Mr. Clerk. Offered by Councilor Baker on behalf of the Boston City Council. Resolution recognizing the 202nd anniversary of the Greek Re Revolution and flag raising for Greek Independence Day. Whereas March 25th is the 202nd anniversary of Greek Independence, and whereas we, we recognize the longstanding relationship between Boston and the Greek people, and whereas the community enriches and enhances the city of Boston through its friendship, business, education, dance, literature, arts, and history. And now, therefore, be it ordered that on Sunday, April 30th, 2023, in recognition of the 202nd anniversary of Greek independence, the Boston City Council orders the property management department to raise the flag of the Hellenic Republic on the third flagpole on City Hall Plaza in place of the City of Boston flag, filed April 26, 2023. 
Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. This is, again, just a flag raising that will happen at the end of the Greek Independence Parade to, to recognize the 202nd anniversary. Um, and we acknowledge Alex here because he's part of the parade. He's part of the Greek community that's, that's added so much to us. We had the Israeli flag ra raising earlier, so I'll do the Israeli flag raising earlier today and then the Greek on Sunday. That's a couple of the original tribes there, the original civilizations, and I think it's time to honor them. And, and, and it also <coughs> will help me with points at home because my wife is half Greek. Um, you know, you always got to keep the wife happy. So uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to do this. And, and if anybody is interested, I think we'll be there around. Parade starts at 1 o'clock on um, Boylston, comes down Tremont, and there'll be a celebration on the plaza that will start with the, with the Greek flag raising and just a, a point of preference is I think the Greeks have the best food. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Council Baker. Would anyone like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council Royal, Council Bar, Council Braden, Council Corda, Council Flaherty, Council Louis Jean, Council Mejia, Council Murphy, Council We're all please add the chair. Councilor, Council Baker seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. This late file matter has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, we're on to green sheets. Okay. Anyone wishing to remove a, green, a matter from the green sheets may do so at this time. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I'd like to pull docket 0711 from page um, page 3 of 21 in the green sheets. Mr. Clerk, can you please um, pull the committee and read it to see if they would allow the docket to come before the body? Yeah. Docket number 0711 from the Committee of City Services and Innovation Technology. Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Armindo Goncalves as a member of the Boston Water and Sewer Commission for a term expiring on January 4th, 2027. Uh, the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. And Councilor Fernandez Anderson. The, this talk at 0711 is now properly before the body. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, the Water and Sewer Commission is run by uh, three commissioners, um, and so there's a vacancy right now, and uh, Armindo Gonsalves is the um, mayor's uh, um, nominee for that. Um, because of the budget schedule, we weren't able to schedule a hearing, um, but I did interview him directly as the chair and also sent his resume out to the whole council. Um, Armindo lives in Boston. Um, he's I actually got history working for the city. He was um, at the BHA briefly and then at the BPDA, um, as his resume shows, from 97 to 2014, so for a very long time, um, uh, doing uh, economic development planning uh, over there. And then he actually went and um, did uh, capital planning and design and um, construction for Rhode Island's um, division of capital assets. Um, so uh, has a lot of experience in kind of like big institutional capital portfolios and how to maintain them um, and invest in them. Uh, and um, uh, But again, I think got tired of driving back and forth to Rhode Island, so now he's back working in the city, but he's been living in the city. Um, and, uh, and I think just brings a lot of um, a lot of great experience professionally, um, is definitely very interested in how we continue to both you know, keep our gray stormwater infrastructure in a state of good repair and also expand green stormwater infrastructure in the city, um, integrating green building designs into the work at um, the capital asset management in Rhode Island was a piece of his work. Um, he also, you know, is really interested in how Boston Water and Sewer can do more internships for our young people um, and kind of pull more people into this really important work with great careers. Um, and uh, yeah, I think he'll be a wonderful person on the commission. Um, and obviously, it would be good for the commission to um, be at full force. So, asking today for colleague support in um, passing his nomination. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Block. Council Block seeks suspension of the rules and passage 
of docket 0711. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Anyone else looking to pull something from the green sheet? We're on to the consent agenda. Okay. I've been informed by the clerk that there are, there's one, one addition. Um, the chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda. Consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted. Today is Councilor Kenzie Block's last council meeting before she departs to be the head of the Boston Housing Authority. I would like now to ask my colleagues if they would like to give any comments or remarks at this time in recognition of the exceptional work Council Block has done on this body, but she's also been a great, a great colleague as well. Let me start with Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Obviously, through the chair, I just want to congratulate uh, my colleague, our colleague, uh, in uh, her um, um, moving on to the BHA. She knows, I think, uh, how fond I am of public housing, being born there. I think my family has a hundred combined hundred years between myself, my mom, uh, my grandmother, and so in what public housing meant to, to my family, you know and I know we're in public housing pretty regularly, and so, and um, Council Bach does as well from her uh, tenure uh, at the BHA, uh, we would see each other regularly, so it's been a pleasure uh, to uh, work uh, with her. Uh, I want to uh, commend her and her family for their service to our city, and that when she came here, uh, and having spent some time here as a staffer, got to, was a, was, was a sort of a, a quick learner in terms of how things worked and, uh, and dove right into process and into our council rules uh, and it's been a pleasure to work with and also has been someone that I've even been able to lean on uh, when there's been uh, some disagreements or when we're looking at uh, sort of different parts of our city business, council business and or rules, uh, always uh, great to bounce things uh, off of each other. So wishing her uh, and uh, the very best in her new endeavor. I know that uh, this uh, we'll be seeing each other probably more regularly uh, across the city because uh, she'll be now citywide uh, instead of just focusing on uh, District 8. So uh, looking forward to uh, many more opportunities to help people, to serve people, and to make a difference, particularly for those that are living uh, in public housing. So congratulations to you. And uh, again, uh, it's been great to serve with you. And uh, I, of all folks I've served, I think probably, I've served with probably the most colleagues, uh, Mr. President, out of anyone, not only here, but uh, in the history of, of the council, be given particularly uh, in light of significant amount of turnover uh, over the last uh, decade. And so um, uh, with that, uh, I know that uh, as colleagues uh, move on to uh, other opportunities, our cross will continue to path. So uh, you, um, although you'll be over at the BHA, people will still associate you as the District 8 City Councilor. Mm -hmm. People will continue to call you asking for help outside of the BHA. Uh, so know that uh, you can always call uh, me as your at-large counselor to help sort of effectuate uh, city services for those folks and um, uh, because your phone will continue to ring and so as the work that you've been doing uh, as a city council takes you uh, on to uh, another great opportunity and challenge uh, know that um, uh, your colleagues here uh, in particular myself will always be willing to to take that call and to return that call and to try to find ways to help people at the end of the day it's not about us it's about the people that we serve uh, and uh, in doing that, we need to continue to work together and make sure that uh, we don't sort of forget where we came from and also know that um, our roles uh, in city government uh, are led by relationships and the relationship that we enjoy uh, as colleagues and even prior to that in your other capacities that uh, it's always been one of mutual respect uh, and appreciation of service to our city. So best of luck and look forward to working with you. Thank, Thank you, you Council Flaherty. The chair recognizes Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, you have the floor. Um, thank you, President. And I just want to rise to say good luck, Councillor Bach. Um, 17 months we've worked together. I appreciate that 
the first few times I reached out and you ignored my phone calls, you explained to me that you're, you're young, you're my kid's age, so you're a millennial, and that you, you don't pick up the calls so that I, I learned how to text to communicate. Or <laughs> It was hard, but I do appreciate that we've had some, some tough conversations, but it's because I know we both love the city, we care about this institution that is the city council and the important role that we play on the council. And I know that in your new role at the BHA, which I'm looking forward to as an at-large councilor, um, I will be seeing you more, like Councilor Flaherty said, around the city. And I know that your heart is in the right place and you are ready for this new adventure. And I know the city is in good hands. So I will miss you here on the council, but I know I will text you in the future. I'll make sure not to call. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. The chair recognizes Councilor Louis Jean. Councilor Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Kenzie, I'm sad to see you go. You are um, so committed to the people of District 8. Um, and I saw, I saw that every time I entered your district. Um, and I could only imagine. Um, when we talked about it, I was like, have you, have you told your constituents yet? Because I know that they're going to be upset because of your level of responsiveness and attention to detail. You get into the thick of it. You get into the weeds. Um, and we are all better because of your commitment to the understanding of this institution, to the historic, to the historic knowledge that you, historical knowledge that you bring um, to this body about this work that we do every day about the city of Boston. Um, and about how you just center the conversation around what the public good is and what it should be and how we should be thinking every day about um, what, we're, what, what we're doing is serving the public good. So I appreciate that. Um, sad that you're going, uh, but happy that you're going to the BHA. Uh, just want to let you know that the, when I first started as an attorney, the VHA folks thought I was really annoying because I would call them all the time with questions, so um, I get texts, whatever. Um, so I guess I will uh, be bothering you even more to make sure that we are meeting the needs of all of our residents um, in the city, um, out, just not, not just District 8, everywhere in the city. Um, and I just, I appreciate your eagerness to, to not only for camaraderie, but also um, to just share your love for the city with others. When my team and I and our families and loved ones were walking uh, the Black Heritage Trail, we were like, hey, we're on Kenzie Street. Called Kenzie, Kenzie was like, I'll come outside. And she joined us and enriched our trip, um, uh, the trail so much more because of all of the personal history and knowledge that you were able to add. So I just, um, I'll miss your enthusiasm for the city, um, your work ethic, um, the way in which you really do uplift your residents and the diversity of your residents whether we're talking about Mission Hill or Beacon Hill, literally there was never an issue that I talked to you about that you didn't have the ins and outs um, basically tattooed somewhere on your body. So I thank you um, for your commitment and I know that your work um, is gonna continue at the Boston Housing Authority and um, that we will continue to be in contact to do the work of the people. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Luijan. The chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Oh, Kenzie, um, I say this uh, as a, with all the love in the world and as a term of endearment, but you really are our, our Dumbledore. And I feel like if there's nobody, if you're a Harry Potter fan, you know exactly what I mean. You're professorial, you, you are in, insanely intelligent, and you're, you're sage and you're wise um, beyond your years. I am very, very sad to, to see you go. It's, it's, it's bittersweet, um, but I'm just so proud of you. I'm very, very proud of you. And you really have solidified yourself to be um, incredibly intelligent, thoughtful, and effective. Um, maneuvering this institution, and I will always remember you as, as the counselor who just wanted to do the work and serve um, the residents. Um, the Power Corps Boston is an incredible legacy that you help put together. It will train and foster generations of environmental stewards because of your work. Um, I'm thinking about Back in, in 2018, when I was an aide, um, and you were also uh, working on this body, you know, doing the, the budget pilot for housing, like this is just um, an incredible legacy, and you have a lot to stand on. 
And so um, I've gotten to know you first as a friend through various uh, party um, events. <laughs> I've gotten to know your family as well. They've, they've welcomed me um, with open arms. And we've just had incredible conversations on how to, to center the work um, and to make the city better, brighter, um, and more vibrant for, for everyone. And I know your heart. And I know you are committed to Boston Housing Residents. And um, I know that you've already worked to make the quality of life for, for BHA uh, residents decent, safe, and stable. So I look forward to continuing that work. Um, I also look forward to working with you because there is a lot of work to get done. I'm not going to start naming all of the various developments in, in my district, but there's, there's a lot that needs to happen. And so um, rising to the occasion and meeting the needs of, of residents is I know that's something that you can do. And so I'm just so incredibly proud of you. Um, congratulations, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Cotta. The Chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to say congratulations and good luck in your new, in your new job. Um, I think you, you, you bring a good, a good attitude and a good um, skill set to the job. So I, I look forward, well, I'm leaving too, so I won't be working <laughs> that much. So. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Baker. The Chair recognizes Council of Royal. Council of Royal. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just say I, I would have gone with Professor McGonigal myself, but uh, Dumbledore is a fine reference. Uh, personally, I just like having a, a somebody who goes through details as much as I do when it comes to language before us and sort of the difference between shall and may and all of the different things that we have talked about. Uh, I think, honestly, uh, we both came in in the same class uh, and very shortly into that class faced sort of a huge international crisis. Uh, that has made sort of this term and, and the term before it different than most terms that have come before us. Uh, and I think in that sense, it was trial by fire pretty much all of the time. Uh, and at every step of that, uh, I've been grateful to have someone who uh, thinks through things to the level that you think through things. I think there has been a lot of conversations. Sometimes we agree on sort of what the interpretation is. Sometimes we don't. But I've always found those conversations really enlightening and coming from a place of looking at policy and sort of language and, and institutional history and there's deviations I think on how we interpret it through different lenses or perspectives but the goal behind it has always been to get it right uh, and I really appreciate that about you that we're constantly trying to just get this stuff right because you have an overarching sense of the fact that these things matter and they touch people's lives and they sort of last on for longer than our terms in office uh, and so if we get it right the first time then there's a whole lot of uh, residual good that comes from that. And so I am really excited to see you step at the BHA, step into the BHA because I know how much you care about it. Um, and I think that when people care deeply about a thing, uh, it just it gravitates through all of the work and it shows in the product and how they go into it and how they go about it. And so I think that the city of Boston is in for a really good time with you at the head of the BHA in terms of what we get out of it and where your focus is and on how that works. And, I say that uh, genuinely that I really, really am excited to see how you step into that role because I know how you are when you feel passionate about a specific thing. Um, and I think that's going to be really good for everybody involved. So I look forward to calling and or texting or I guess dropping in uh, and, and having conversations with you about projects uh, in my district, but also I think as we look at how housing works throughout the city. Um, and I know that's stuff that you're really excited about. I know you're already probably got like a 20 page PowerPoint slide for how you're going to do this uh, that you probably brought to the interview. Uh, but really grateful for you uh, and for the ways in which you've uh, sort of served on this body. I know that your district is uh, going to miss you uh, profoundly. Uh, and so uh, my hope is that you don't stray too far from the public service side of it beyond just being in the BHA because I know how much environmental issues and how much local issues have mattered to you throughout your life. So grateful to you. I uh, look forward to seeing you in this new role. Really think you'll do great. Uh, and now I can have conversations with you as, as a friend and not just a colleague. So look forward to it. Thank you, Council Roy. I'm going to go to Council Worrell, then Council Braden, then Council Mejia. But the chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Kenzie, uh, you'll be missed. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. Um, the technical and historical context you bring into the city council um, 
has always challenged me to dive deeper into the, into the, um, the, the topic. And I know that our constituents in the city of Boston appreciate it, because I remember one day we were out and uh, one of the constituents came up and just said, thank you for making uh, that hearing um, easy to understand. Um, and that's something that you know, I'll miss and the whole city of Boston will miss. But I also want to just say congratulations on your new role and I'm excited and happy for you that you're able to pursue um, your passion um, at the BHA. And I have a long list of investments I won't get into now, um, but look forward to working with you in your new role. Congratulations and thank you for your service to the city of Boston. Thank you, Council Worrell. The Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you're not Madam Chair. Thank you, pardon. <laughs> Gender bender. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm, I'm going to miss Kenzie um, as a colleague and or my right-hand woman here next to me in District 8. Um, we were in that class of 2020 that we were in 10 weeks and then COVID happened and we were all working remotely. But we, we sort of, it was a trial by fire and we, we developed working relationships and support for each other uh, under very difficult circumstances. I could always um, rely on Kenzie to have a very incisive and thoughtful uh, consideration of all the issues that we were dealing with at any given moment. And I also constantly reminded, uh, recognized her commitment to the common good. Uh, every issue that came before us, there was that question, uh, how, how do we serve the common good? And the Power Core um, uh, pro program in the city of Boston is really part of our legacy as a city councillor here. And that we're going to be, incredibly grateful for going forward. Um, she also, in her, in her expertise and, and interest in housing, is always trying to expand the envelope in terms of finding creative ways to uh, increase our affordable access to affordable housing, increase um, tenant stability, and just to really make Boston a place where everyone can live. So I'm really delighted that she's going to be the, uh, in charge over at BHA and I look forward to working with her on, on the BHA projects in my district. Um, you know, I, I also want to recognize her, her, um, her credentials as a historian and um, I think she brings a historic perspective to our conversations. She has a, an acute understanding of where we've come from as a city in our long history. And uh, she also uh, is very mindful of where we're headed to and how we can work together to build an inclusive, equitable, equitable and sustainable future. So I'm delighted and congratulate, I'm delighted that she's going to BHA. Uh, we're going to miss her greatly here in the, in the body, but I, I know where she lives. I, I, and and um, I don't suppose this is the end of the conversation or the end of our working together, but um, I wish you many congratulations, Kenzie, and uh, I do know how to text you now, now that I've figured out how to use a cell phone. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Kenzie. Uh, it's so crazy because uh, both uh, Kenzie and I um, have a special long history that goes back 20 something, if not more years ago, because um, we both had some deep roots at MTV. Uh, I remember I was working at MTV, I was a political reporter then, and we did an event here in the city of Boston, it was at the House of Blues, and I think Kenzie was in the crowd as a little youngster there. So even at the age of 12, I believe, Kenzie, you were already politicking. <laughs> and creating mass disruption in the city of Boston. So I just think that that's such a beautiful, for me, it's just like it came full circle when we discovered that we were back in the day already in the trenches and trying to get people activated and engaged in their own lives. So um, that always stood uh, near and dear to me. Um, and the fact that I grew up on BHA and you're gonna go there to help save it. So I'm so incredibly encouraged because of your work here on the council, especially around digital equity access, language, you have been such a leader um, in the space in terms of making sure that information justice is at the center of making things easier for people. And I think, um, I think BHA is going to be better because of you. And I'm looking forward to that. And then there's three things that I want to uplift in terms of our work together. Um, lowering the voting age as a result of our uh, MTV Rock the Vote and 
experiences. Uh, it was such a pleasure to work alongside you in your office in getting that um, home rule petition out of uh, committee and into the state house. And I just want to say thank you for your leadership, for bringing so much insight and bringing even somebody from around the world to participate and helping to influence us in that space. So I just want to say thank you for your hard work there, as well as um, the work that we did together on digital, digital equity. Um, you were at the front and center, always advocating. Um, and I know that, again, when it comes to BHA, your, um, I'm going to say your constituents, because those are going to be your constituents at this point, are going to really uh, reap those benefits in terms of the work that you've done. And then lastly, and I think the one that I feel was the biggest, um, the most, I would say, at least it was for me, the, the, the one that I have the most gratitude for is when I asked you to be my co-sponsor with the hearing order for reparations here in the city of Boston in 2021. And at the time it was an election year, so you would be crazy to think about talking about election year during, an, during a, I mean reparations during an election year, but you leaned into it and you stood up and joined me as a co-sponsor. And you even had reservations because you said I'm a white woman. Um, and you were so incredibly thoughtful about what this moment meant, but you stood up and joined me um, and supporting me and the, and the community in not only having the hearing, but working alongside community to define for themselves what this moment was all about. And I just wanna say thank you for that, um, Councillor Bach. Um, it meant a lot to the, the, the folks who were, who were leading the effort and when the, uh, the conversation around the task force came up, they were really um, eager to hear what you had to say um, and what your thoughts were on that. So I just want you to know that, you know, we talked about legacy here, and I just want you to know that in, in so many ways, you played a big role in helping us to establish a reparations task force here in the city of Boston. And I just want to let you know that historical perspective um, is, is, is definitely one of the things that brought you um, so near and dear to that conversation. So I just want to say thank you for your leadership in that space and for supporting us uh, through that process. And then lastly, I always kid around, you know, you're a doctor, Dr. Bach, y'all. Get that title right, she, right? Or was it honorary or did you earn it? She earned it, even worse. <laughs> she earned it. And I think it was a constituent that brought it to my attention the other day. Like, oh, Dr. Bach, you better respect that name. I was like, okay. So, you know, your first year here, um, you were a professor at Harvard, I believe. Was you were a professor somewhere? And I was just so incredibly in awe that you were a professor while you were also a city councilor. And I didn't know how you were able to juggle all of that. But you found a way to, in doing so even during COVID, which speaks volumes to your work ethic and to your commitment. And so I just want to say thank you, uh, Councillor Bach, Dr. Bach, um, for educating us and for being so generous with um, everything that you shared with the council. I think we're all better uh, for it. And I just want to uh, congratulate you and, and thank you as you move on your journey. Vamos, Bobby H A. Thank you, thank you, Council Mejia. Now it's my turn. I also want to recognize Council Bach for the exceptional contributions you've made to the body. And what I admire most about you is you, you always showed up to a meeting prepared and you would never wing it. You were always asking the right questions. You were always you always took the job serious and never yourself, and didn't take yourself seriously. Um, and we always were able to laugh, but you were always able to work in a professional manner for your constituents, and I know how much they mean to you and how important this job was to you, because there's really nothing like being a district city councilor, and I know how much respect you had for the position and for your constituents especially. During the pandemic, I would go on these Zoom meetings with my constituents in the Bay Village, and Kenzie's parents are, are my constituents. And every time I'd go on the Zoom meeting, I would always say to Kenzie's parents, Gay and Alex, I would say, I'm their, I'm their favorite city councilor. 
and Gay would always say, no, you, Ed, you're the second favorite city council. Um, and I bring, I bring your parents up because every time I think of Kenzie, I think of her parents, and I know how proud your parents are of you. And I know how, how, I know how proud your community of the Bay, Bay Village and Back Bay and Beacon Hill are of you and the, the hard work you put into becoming a community leader the hard work you put into passing the Community Preservation Act, getting 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 elected to the Boston City Council, being being an expert an expert really on city city finances and in quality of life issues. So we have the most respect for you, Kenzie, because of the way you conducted yourself here on this body, and you've represented yourself well, and you've represented your family well in the city of Boston. So proud to call you a friend and I'm, I'm somewhat a little jealous that you're going to uh, the Boston Housing Authority. That's the job I always wanted. Um, but I know you're gonna do a tremendous job. You're dedicated to the residents and, and tenants of public housing and we're proud of you on the Boston City Council. Congratulations, Kenzie. Your turn is right now. <laughs> the chair recognizes Councilor Kenzie Bock. Councilor Kenzie Bock, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, um, and thank you so much to all my colleagues for um, such kind words. Um, and uh, uh, and I also want to say that um, the folks over at the Old State House know that we might be a few minutes late. So just um, <laughs> for those of you who are joining me afterwards, that um, I uh, yeah just want to reciprocate with a few words about colleagues um, uh, and then just. A couple um, other words, um, uh, and, and I'll, I'll do the colleagues who are, are not with us just um, briefly because you know, as we always say, we can watch the tape afterwards. Um, so, uh, p potentially one of the reasons that I prefer quick texts to phone calls is that when I was running for um, city council, Councillor uh, Royo and I had one phone call, which lasted more than an hour, and um, and I, I learned that some of us uh, are like talk for a long time, um, but, uh, but I think, as he said, we came in in the same class here, and both of us uh, are really interested in legislative detail, really interested in um, uh, kind of like the institutions of the city and how they work, and I think um, one of the things uh, that I've always appreciated is that we both grew up kind of steeped in this Boston political context and really starting out from the sense of how much it matters, like how much what we do in this building matters. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's a really important um, thing to know and believe when we do this work every day. Um, and so really uh, appreciate uh, Councilor Royo for sharing that. Um, Councilor Baker, uh, I, um, Councilor Baker is like the one of us who doesn't give his sign on easily on legislation. Um, and so I always feel like particularly accomplished when Frank signs on to my um, resolutions. Uh, and so, um, but just, and again, I think somebody who takes this work really seriously, um, and uh, and I've also always appreciated that both of us are very strongly pro, um, you know, public workers doing public work, not sort of farming everything out to private contracts, but really saying like, you know, we should have um, we should have this important work being done in the city. And, and frankly, I think when we talk about trash contracts and stuff, we're seeing the negative effects of farming it out um, over time. So really. Uh, I appreciate and and um, and I think also just the amount that Councillor Baker brings uh, himself into the space and uh, uh, and especially um, some of the like when we've had announcements and we've talked about personal things in our life. I mean, I think Frank is probably like responsible for reducing me to tears more often than anyone else in the council. Just kind of talking about some of the things that we all go through um, uh, in our communities and families. Um, Liz, uh, Liz. Liz and I have great dinners, um, and uh, we're, I'm not going to miss them because we can still do them. Um, 
I first met Liz again. Uh, like uh, Ricardo, we were in the same council class. Um, and like I said, so with like, like he and I, we had, we had one conversation during that. We were obviously in different districts, so we were like kind of comparing notes. Um, similarly, Liz and I, I got a drink um, late, uh, kind of early in, towards the general election. Um, and I remember feeling like pretty pleased with myself about the fact that like we'd raised a lot of money in District 8, um, which is probably the most expensive district to run in in the city because it's the wealthiest district in the city. Um, and then I was talking to Liz and I was just like, oh my gosh, like Liz has raised very little money and yet has this unbelievable campaign apparatus and this just like enormous grassroots power and I felt very humbled by it. I was very much like, yeah, okay, so it's nice to be able to call people and ask them for donations, but you can't fake that real community buy-in I'm supporting you. And I've continued to be so impressed by Liz's grassroots uh, spirit. And obviously, as the District 8, District 9 counselors, with an enormous number of students in our district, um, lots of housing that we feel is not up to snuff. Um, I think that Liz and I like, deal with a lot of the same constituent issues day in, day out, the rats, the trash. Um, and uh, it's just been really great to have a very sensible grounded friend uh, to talk through those things about. Um, uh, yeah, and again, I'm not saying I'm gonna miss anybody because I'm about to work with all of you in this BHA context and it's gonna be great. Um, so, uh, Councillor Coletta, as she alluded, I just wanna clear, be clear for the record, when she said we knew each other from party things, she meant the Democratic Party, um, not, not the party circuit, just to be clear. Um, um, so, um, my, my claim to fame is that when the, when the Sal Lamentina seat uh, came up in 2017, um, I called Gigi and I said, you should run. Like, are you getting ready to run? And she was like, no, 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 I'm getting ready to run. This amazing woman, Lydia Edwards, um, who I also knew of and obviously um, did a fantastic job and became one of my best friends on this body. Um, but Gigi was the first person I thought of for this seat because of how much she was representing her community already even in her like teens and early 20s. Um, and so it just feels extremely natural and right that you've ended up here. Um, and it's just one of my regrets that um, we won't overlap for longer. Um, I think we're not even quite making it a year as counselors overlapping, um, but just continue to be really excited about everything you're gonna do, especially like climate change resiliency. Thank you for the power core um, acknowledgements. I, that's something that does mean a lot to me. Um, and, uh, but I'm really, you know, it's a, it's a great relief when you leave a legislative body to feel like there are people who are continuing and extending the work that you've done in areas that you really care about. And like, there's a lot of housing champions on this council um, who I'm excited to work at with at BHA. There's a lot of green champions on this council as well um, and climate resiliency and, um, and yeah, and just, and Gigi and also Liz, you know, these are things that I know are gonna continue to be a big focus. Um, uh, Tanya's not here, but I just wanted to say that I, uh, when I first walked into Tanya's headquarters in the fall of 21, um, she, there was like a youth arts activity going on as I walked in. Um, and then every time I came back to the headquarters for packets or anything, there was like always like a fashion show or like some other thing that was kind of activating arts in the community. And so that's something that just, it really stuck with me at the time and that continuing focus on the arts corridor and arts in Roxbury has been something um, that's really impressed me. Uh, Michael, um, when I walked in here, I, start, I um, took a job to be budget director for uh, Councillor Anissa Sabi george um, and it was 2016, and I had just been in all of the counselors' offices bothering them about signing on to the Community Preservation Act and putting it on the ballot. And so it was like a month after I'd been visiting with everybody. Um, and Michael Flaherty was not somebody we had to convince. Michael had been for the Community Preservation Act in 2001 when it had gone down to defeat, um, and he was right back on the train right mm -hmm. from the beginning. Um, and. Uh, and so, but I had recently been in his office. He knew me because he knows my father. Um, and I, uh, I remember walking into the lobby right there and I saw Councillor Flaherty and I said, oh, Councillor Flaherty, like I'm actually like working for Anissa now for a bit for the budget. Um, so I, you know, I won't be bothering you about any constituent stuff. Like I'm on the staff side now. So like, don't worry, I won't be knocking down your door. And I remember Michael being like, Kenzie, I still work for you. Like, it was this kind of, like, sort of, like, I'm still your at-large counselor. Like, yeah, yeah, you're Anissa Stafford, but if you need something, come to me. And it 
Uh, it just jogged my memory because he just said that just now, the sort of like, hey, when you're the BHA person, if you need something from a counselor, call me. And I just think that kind of uh, um, expansive approach to, you know, your, when you're an at-large counselor, you're at everybody's service um, is something that I've always appreciated from, uh, from Michael. Um, uh, Councilor Lara is not here, um, but uh, really looking forward to working together on public housing. Um, I think we're both big believers in um, public goods, uh, investing in them, kind of trying to break uh, capital logic where it really hurts our communities. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and uh, I'm, although not a member of DSA, basically a Christian socialist, so um, I appreciate having, having that perspective on the body. Um, Councilor Louis Jen, Ruth C, I'm gonna miss sharing a wall. Um, and, uh, and I feel like, and your amazing purple couch. Um, she has a purple couch, I have a blue couch. Um, they're themed and uh, yeah, it's just, um, you know, I think I, as somebody who thinks about things a lot, maybe overthinks things, I really appreciate that in you as well. Um, I am not a lawyer, but I was raised by a family of lawyers, and like sometimes it shows. And I again really appreciate um, that kind of uh, lawyer nerdiness, um, but also just uh, hugely grateful for you know so many of the hearings that I've been in that you've organized. I was thinking about the lending discrimination one that we had a few weeks back. Um, just I think have been so on point and so good about kind of thinking about what's the whole issue and bringing the right stakeholders to the table and then asking like what are the action items like what's coming next out of this and um, and again it's it's one of the reasons that I feel really comfortable you know the BHA job there's a huge piece of it that is about um, you know managing and investing in and growing our public housing portfolio but there's also a huge piece of it that's about making the private housing market fair for our voucher holders, um, which is also an enormous proportion of the puzzle. Of the puzzle. And, um, and I think that like when we think about affirmatively furthering fair housing and fair housing testing and stuff, there's a lot that the BHA can do in partnership with this body and with City Hall, and um, I'm really excited to do that work together. Um, Julia, I was gonna tell the MTV story if you didn't, so um, you know, choose or lose, that was the motto that year. Um, and uh, yeah, I... Um, we go, we go way back, as you say, um, and I, uh, and we're cla and we're classmates, you know. Again, so uh, Ricardo and Julia and Liz and I, we came in together and had this insane experience of having the third month be COVID. Um, I think that uh, one of the things you mentioned, some of the stuff that we've worked on together, lowering the voting age, reparations, digital equity. One of the things that I've always really appreciated in my ways and means role, and then my ARPA rule is that like a lot of the budget or ARPA amendments that Julia was pushing for were like things I also wanted. So like, you know, in the 2020, you know, is that we got that last minute expansion of the thousand year round year youth jobs. And then like in 21, we got the money for the municipal broadband like study. And, um, and we, there's just been, and then like this in ARPA, right, there was the money for the, um, for us to, really pilot how we can have childcare that's off hours and that you know raises the wages and quality um, for our childcare workers and have like co-ops there and kind of really think about this whole childcare ecosystem differently. Um, and it's really like, you know, obviously when you're in those roles of trying to negotiate appropriations with the administration, it's like really helpful when things are not your things. You get to be like, oh no, this other colleague really needs this to happen. Um, and I just feel um, like we've been so aligned on so many of those things and, and I've really appreciated that. Um, and I also love your refrains, um, you know, the like, the, the little um, repeated phrases, like the all means all or, you know, if you're not at the table, all, because it's not a strength of mine. Like I um, feel very self-conscious about repeating things, um, but I think that actually, um, you know, I think these things, actually refrains go all the way back, like, in Spanish poetry, they're one of the ways that like you get oriented to where you are in the poem, like the refrain comes back. Um, and I just, I think that they can be really important and it's always been something that you've taught me a lot about is communications and like how to kind of communicate um, with people uh, here in the city so they know what we're up to here in this imposing building. Um, on the subject of appropriations, Aaron, uh, I, um, I was really glad to see your advocacy for the recovery community um, in that ARPA process and 
I love that visit we did to the rock climbing gym um, uh, at the Phoenix. I, you know, I do regret that we haven't done more of those things together. Um, I, I, I didn't really think I would make it to the top of the rock climbing wall, so it's also like a personal moment of achievement. Um, uh, it, yeah, it is true. I feel like on the generational gradient, like you referenced my preference for texting over phone calls. Um, I also feel like the generational gradient is reflected in the pat in the fact that like. Aaron gives me rides places, which I really appreciate. Um, folks know that I'm a, I'm a MBTA and a walking person, um, but there have been many occasions on which um, you have saved me on that front, so thank you. Um, and, and thanks also uh, for being so kind to my staff. Um, Brian, uh, I'm like sad to be jumping off. This goes for all the new counselors, but just when like, you know, I feel like we're really getting to know each other. Um, I'm so excited to have you on the body. I think like there's just a practicalness and a kind of like what can we get done orientation um, that you have to the work. And I'm so excited that again to keep the ARPA theme going um, that uh, that you push for all this money for BHA to do home ownership. So like thank you. Um, and I think it's going to give us a real opportunity to partner together. Um, and uh, another 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 long phone call guy, but. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's, it's good. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and Ed, as you said, you're my parents' counselor, and I'm so <laughs> glad to have them in your district. Um, I, uh, have always, especially when, like, the alley behind my parents and their neighbor's house had, like, a rat infestation, I just felt like Ed was the best man for that job. Um, and, uh, and as he's continuing to show, really, like, an amazing focus on that, but, um, you know, the, I, I, I mentioned when I was talking about Councillor Arroyo, I think what it, what it means to have these like multiple generations of your family that have been engaged in local public service. Um, and I feel that very deeply about the Flynn's. Um, my, uh, my dad and my grandfather um, were involved in your father's campaign. Um, and so I've always grown up hearing the stories about that. I think that the whole reason that Billy McGonigal hired me to the BHA in the first place was that my grandfather had supported Ray Flynn. Like I don't, it was definitely not the PhD. Um, and, uh, and I just, um, and that focus on housing, you know, your father's campaign that launched in public housing um, is just something that you continue so much. And so I'm so excited to work together on public housing. Uh, and, um, and I remember when there was that, when you did run in 2017, my dad and I were on opposite sides. I backed Mike Kelly. Um, my father backed Ed Flynn. My father's explanation, looking at me uncomprehendingly, was he's a Flynn. Of course I'm with him. Um, and I was young, you know, and I and went the other way. But it turned out that my dad was right, and he's been a remarkable counselor for my parents. And I'm just I'm really grateful for that. And I'm sorry to be taking your dream job. It's also mine. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's good in that sense that certain things worked out certain ways from my perspective. Um, you know, besides uh, besides the twelve current colleagues, I do just want to acknowledge um, I've had six other colleagues on the council. I've had opportunities to talk about them in these kinds of settings, so I won't do that now. But I do just want to thank Anissa who brought me here in the first place, um, and uh, Andrea and Matt and Kim and um, Lydia, uh, Lydia who I will just say has always been a dangerous friend for me because you'd be talking and you'd be sort of hypothetically saying, well, we could do this thing. And then Lydia is the one who's always like, let's do it. We're doing it now. It's already happening. Um, and, uh, um, and I'm excited to get a chance to work with her in a new role um, as the housing chair at the Senate and doing housing. Um, and, then, uh, and then of course, Michelle um, who, uh, uh, is finally uh, getting me to come work for her. Um, and I'm obviously extremely excited and would not be making a move from representing constituents directly myself to um, working for the mayor if I didn't believe tremendously in um, her and her leadership and her belief in public goods and, uh, and real belief in the Boston Housing Authority and public housing and our voucher families and everything that we need to do for them um, in this moment. Um, I just, I want a couple, I have a few more thank yous, so I would appreciate everyone bearing with. Um, I would be remiss in this moment not to thank the IGR team, um, and I mean both, you know, Claire and Chantal and Neil now, um, but also Caitlin, Fernando, Pilar, everybody who's kind of worked with us over this 
um, crazy period. Uh, I think that um, and in the, I was just getting to know uh, IGR and what they even did in the opening months of the pandemic. Um, and it was a strange thing because the kind of like oppositional dynamic between the council and the mayor sort of broke down in this weird way where we were obviously just all Bostonians trying to figure things out. Um, and I was the new ways and means chair and we were supposed to start our budget hearings and the pandemic hit and there was this real question of like, are we even gonna do budget hearings? Um, and ultimately we decided that we were gonna do them together um, and that that was actually an important piece of the puzzle for the city to see that we were continuing to do that work um, and, um, and that even as everything was turning upside down, we still had to talk about the future and like how we were gonna steward the resources that we had. And so, you know, when I think about IGR and I think about Emma and Justin um, on, the, on the finance side um, in that moment, it was, it was really important to me how we were able to partner. Um, and, I, and I do wanna give a special shout out to Neil who has been my only consistent dance partner through the budget of 2020, the budget of 21, and the ARPA of, of 22, um, and has really, in that process, become a friend. Um, it's something like Stockholm Syndrome, but I'm not sure which of us is the prisoner in the scenario, so, um, you know, it's just, it's been great working together. Um, I, I also wanna give a shout out to city staff in general. I was thinking about, you know, Henry, Lutin, and then um, also leaving this week is John Vizella, who's been unbelievable at Public Works. And to me, those two people just kind of like symbolize the legions of city workers who just day in, day out, they make things actually happen. They make us look good if we call them and they get the work done. Um, and uh, especially in COVID, they just really were unsung heroes. And we say that, but I, I just, I don't know that people know really how much people took on themselves in that, in that season. Um, and, uh, and I think it's still something that needs to be said and needs to be recognized. Um, and speaking of staff, really want to recognize our central staff. Um, one of the things that I say sometimes, a little jokingly, but not that jokingly, about the council is I say, well, the thing you have to remember is that elected officials are first and foremost principals, which is different from managers. Um, and I think that, you know, people who are, like all of us, we come with, like, a lot of capacities and a lot that we bring to the table, but the question of kind of like, how does the day in day out logistics of the council happen? Um, like that lands on central staff and Michelle Goldberg is amazing. Um, Jalady did a great job as staff director before her. Um, Michelle and Shane uh, and Cora were like my team and budget. Um, I'm like just, you know, Ron and uh, uh, Megan and Juan and, um, now I've started my list, so I gotta make sure I get everybody. Um, I mean, Lorraine, obviously, handling our personnel orders. Uh, Christine, with all of her wealth of knowledge. Candace, um, Ashley, who was here, uh, and Carrie, who um, invented a way for us to do remote hearings in those early months that involved him being alone in this chamber because we couldn't run things remote, remote. So it was all of us were home and Carrie was here making it happen. Just central staff has been unbelievable. Um, and, and there's my staff, um, starting on the campaign with Carolyn and Henry, and Henry came in here, um, then joined by Emily and uh, John and Lauren, and then since then we've added Kennedy and Anthony um, and Jake and just, uh, you know, every one of my staffers. I don't have to tell this audience because you're counselors that your staffers are the ones who make you look good, they do the work, nothing happens without them. When I think on the policy side about firmly furthering for housing, Power Corp Boston, uh, our like, you know, zoning amendment, just a million things that we've worked on. I've relied so much on my policy staff and then on the constituent service side, there are just things that I learned that our office has done all the time that I um, can't really claim any hand in except having hired good people. Um, and I just, I really wanna express my thanks to all of them. Um, and uh, I guess just a couple more, um, my uh, elected colleagues, I won't list them all, but when you're a district eight, you have like a million overlap state elected officials because of the way the districts are drawn. So um, the, I've just had a great uh, set of colleague relationships, which is key because we also have a lot of state land in the district, so we're always going to them for things. Um, and they've just been wonderful. Um, former Mayor Marty Walsh um, had a really good working relationship and uh, obviously just he carried a lot of weight in COVID and I wanted to acknowledge him. Um, the 
uh, all of our labor partners. You know, I think a lot about District 8, the fact that it's a place where, on average, the residents are wealthier, although there's still a very great um, uh, inequality gradient in District 8 in terms of who lives there. But it's also where a lot of people who work in the city of Boston work. And when we talk about, you know, janitors and hotel workers and um, just, like, so many people, it's so critical to, like, what shared prosperity looks like in the city that these folks have great... Um, great jobs and union jobs, and there's just been a lot of really strong advocacy that I've been proud to be part of on that front, so I wanna thank all the labor partners. Um, and I can't begin to thank all of the neighborhood leaders and the people who manage their patches in every corner of District 8. Um, I see Alison Poltenas over here, so I'm gonna shout her out because she's my one constituent in this room right now. Um, but Alison, I mean, literally knows every invasive species that is in McLaughlin Park and is like actively working on helping to pull them out and is managing like a little wood that's on a paper street in, uh, in Mission Hill. And I just think like, that's the thing about being a counselor is that you, you get to do some things, but mostly you get this like ringside seat on everything that everybody else in the city of Boston is doing to make the city great. Um, and you have this kind of kaleidoscope opportunity to cross people's thresholds and see the city as they see it. Um, and I have been so privileged to get to do that with the residents of Mission Hill and Fenway and Back Bay and Beacon Hill and the West End. Um, and as Councillor Flaherty said, I will continue to be their District 8 shadow counselor in spirit. Um, and I'm really excited, as I said in a letter to them, to sort of pull the BHA archipelago and the District 8 archipelago closer together, because I think that's what kind of the whole city of Boston looks like, um, is, is that all those things intertwine together. Um, and of course, I want to thank all my friends who knocked doors and did a million things to get me elected to this job that I am now leaving. So thank you and sorry. Um, and, uh, and special thanks to my parents, Gay and Alex, my sister Abby, my brother Oliver, who um, people in my district are still asking after because they knocked a lot of doors for me, um, a lot of doors. And, um, you know, and, and all my family, my aunt and uncle, my cousins, um, my grandfather, John Lister, who passed, have all been part of it, my grandmother, Joan Bach. Um, and then a, a like special shout out um, to my grandfather, uh, John Bach, who uh, passed long before I ran for city council. Um, but he, he was really a hauser, which is sort of a phrase that some of us use for you know people who just think that first and foremost, people need to be housed. And that's gotta be a really animating policy goal for all of us. Um, and so yeah, he, he was a hauser and I'm proud to be a Hauser, and I feel like I'm able to extend some of the work that he did, and uh, and and that means a lot for me. Um, Mr. President, I just can I take two more minutes to just yes, go ahead, Council Buck. I wanted to say something about the Boston City Council. Um, I've been thinking recently about the council and I sort of, and, and kind of how I feel about it and, and what I want people to understand. And, um, and I, think, I think sometimes, and, and forgive me, this is a weird metaphor, but um, I've been thinking about like a sort of movie where the, like, the, the credits start rolling and you see you're in this kind of like wooden room and there, and inside the wooden room, it lets sort of moving are like all of these creatures, lions and tigers and bears and lizards and mice, and they're all kind of like hissing at each other. And there's like a Morgan Freeman type voice that's like, you know, this is a story about rivalry and, uh, you know, nature red and tooth and claw. And like you sort of like you think you're in one story. And then like his voice breaks, and then you zoom out and you go through. So you're no longer in the room. You go up above and you see that actually the room you were in is a boat, it's actually like an arc, that a wooden arc that's being like tossed in these tempest waves. Um, and, and you realize like, oh, I'm looking at Noah's Ark, like all these creatures are together and actually they're stuck in a storm, like they're in a tempest. And the real question here is like, are they gonna, are they gonna make it out together? And you know, and the Morgan Freeman voice cuts back in and says, you know, maybe that actually, no, wait, this is a story about a community going through a storm and, and how it stays afloat. Um, and the reason I say, I give you that metaphor, it, I think to explain it, I have to talk a little bit about, one more time, about COVID. Um, COVID hit in March 2020, and 
I feel like those of us who are in public life could go our whole lives wondering what we would do in a crisis. And nobody who's been in public life lately has to wonder because we all got hit with it. Um, and it was so scary. Um, you know, I was upstairs on the ninth floor with some BPDA folks doing spreadsheets, trying to figure out who we needed to deliver food to and how we were going to get that done. And, um, you know, and like Mike Christopher is calling everybody he knows who might have a freezer. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just trying to like find people who have vans and people who have boxes. And then meanwhile, like you don't know what is even safe to do. So you don't want to ask your staff anything. Right. And, um, and so you're, there's like, there were a lot of sort of principals in the city of Boston who ended up doing a lot of that work because none of us knew enough to want to ask anybody else to do it. Um, and for me, it was, I mean, just those months are like this blur of just like delivering thousands and thousands of boxes of food and, um, and not knowing how long it was going to be. And then also knowing a lot of people who were getting sick, right, and dying. I mean, I think I, I had the experience um, of talking to a lot of friends from around the country and around the world, um, like a few months into the pandemic, and realizing that, oh, like most of my friends don't actually know anyone who's died of COVID, or they know like one. And like, I'm in Boston where we got hit so early, and like, I know dozens. And the people who I know between them, right, know hundreds. And it was just like this extremely traumatic community experience. Um, and we, and there was so much that was so inspiring about how people responded whether it's the food stuff, whether it's like I said, the idea that we sort of like carried on the budget, the way that the hospitals and the universities pulled together, just like the million things we did, you know, recognizing health disparities, but then like the aggressive work when we had vaccines to get that message out and the fact that we actually saw that reflected in the data, like this community did so much that was so good. But I think sometimes that we don't acknowledge like the trauma that we all went through. Um, and, and I also think that we've ended up in a place of being a little bit competitive about that trauma. And what I mean by that is like, I think that, I think that um, you know, COVID brought to light how much the disparities in our community are just, are life and death, right? They brought to light that if you're crowded into housing that's too, too dense um, and nobody's got any space, you know, the mortality went up, or that if like people don't speak your language and you're providing critical public health information, like you're really in trouble. And so they like added this kind of sense of urgency to everything that we needed to do on a policy level. But also, um, every one of our communities lot was losing so many people, right? Like nobody was spared. Um, and even, you know, even in Boston, even when we talk about the racial disparities, to really see them, you have to control for age because so much of our older population is white. And so we lost a, a ton of people in those communities because of who was like in their 80s and 90s in the city disproportionately. And I think that like, I think we just lost so much and then, and, and we're, and we're all raging still in this city with kind of like that grief and loss and also that sense of urgency, like none of these issues that were uncovered can wait. And, and then sometimes what we hear when we speak to each other is like, I have no room for your loss, your grief, your urgency, I have my own. And, and the thing that I've been thinking about is that the biggest lesson from this moment for me is that you cannot ration sympathy. Like that to me is what that phrase that Mel King said that's been echoing all the month is about, the love is the question and the answer. It's that every time we try to like ration sympathy, ration love, we try to say like there's only so much of this and we can only afford it for certain things. Like it, it collapses in on itself because love is a muscle that like the more that we work it, the more of it that it, there is. Um, and I think that it's actually been the cities of Boston's strength historically to try to, um, to, try to expand the pie and specifically to, to really, um, really like love one another in a civic context. So I, I think that a Boston where we ration sympathy for one another cannot be the city that we need it to be in this moment. It can't meet our present crises of recovering from the pandemic, of fighting the climate crisis, of making this that city for shared prosperity that I mentioned, a city for people rather than a site for capital profit interests. Um, and so that's, that's what I meant with my weird metaphor about the boat. Like to me, 
we're on that boat together and the sea around us is wild and deep and we can't afford to set any fires on board. You know, I think we've made this, it's kind of like this precious wooden craft, this municipal boat of state in my vision um, with generations of effort. We've carved that phrase from the library free for all into its beams. You know, we have this deep Boston civic pride and belief in the public goods that we construct and care for together. Um, it's actually something the philosophers call civic friendship, which is not personal friendship, but it's also not just civility. I actually think it's what the imam was talking about way at the beginning of our meeting, civic friendship. This idea that there's a kind of trust that we're all working for the public good and the commonwealth, even when we passionately disagree, um, and that we're kind of bonded together by this shared purpose and this like shared craft that we're on. And, and I don't actually think that there's a city in America that has cultivated that ethic, that belief in public goods that we steward together more successfully than Boston. Um, and I think we have to continue to strengthen that if we're gonna navigate the waters before us today. Um, so I wanted to say that because I'm now gonna go care for one of those crucial public institutions um, that we care for together, the Boston Housing Authority, uh, which I love. Um, and I want to leave this council, which I also love, um, with that pledge of ongoing civic friendship to you all, um, and gratitude for everybody on the deck of this uh, shared beloved ship. So, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bork. So we're getting towards the end of the meeting. <laughs> and I would ask if my counselors, my council colleagues would stay to the very end because if, I, if we lose one more person, <laughs> we might not have a quorum. So we're getting close to it. Um, memorials. Today we're going to adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. For Councilor Braden, Beverly, <coughs> Regan, Oliveri. For Councilor Coletta, George Faro. Councilor Flaherty, Kevin Joyce, George Kalamokas. For Councilor Flynn, William Bill Fru. Edward Joseph Connerty. For Council Alara, Vivian Carrera, Karen Wepsick, Joy Alice Cotron. A moment of silence, please. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, we do so in memory of those individuals mentioned we are now scheduled to meet again in the Ionella Chamber on Wednesday, May 3rd at 12 noon. Before we adjourn, I want to say thank you to the city clerk and the clerk's team. I want to say thank you to the court stenographer, city council, central staff, my city council colleagues. Um, I also want to recognize the um, IGA team that does a tremendous job working with us as well. Um, and also, before we adjourn, I also want to mention that if my colleagues can join us, we, we do have a special presentation we would like to give um, Council Block right after, this, uh, right after this meeting. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. Aye. The Council is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.